This story is simple. A kid from Queens gets bitten by a spider and becomes a wanted vigilante in Mizutofu, Japan. But what if the timeline gets messed up the slightest bit? What if he came along one year before a certain green-haired boy met his idol? Even if the people around Peter Parker change, that won't make him stop doing his best to be a spectacular hero. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Omni-sensei. Welcome to, What If Spider-Man Was In My Hero Academia? Part 1. Hit that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Also, remember to check out the original story linked in the description. Without further ado, let's get into it. The sound of the passing cars felt like music to his ears, the bits of moonlight that poked through the clouded night sky shone down on his spot sitting on the roof edge of a vacant office building as he dangled his feet freely in the air. He loved night patrolling, too bad he could only do it when May took the night shift. A thing which started to be more and more common since they lost the second income in their house. This is Peter Benjamin Parker, a 14-year-old kid from Queens now known as Spider-Man, one of Musutafu's newest vigilantes. And while he would love to go into detail on how he got to where he was, you can guess how things went down. Random spider bite, workless kid given the ability to do whatever a spider can, underground fighting. Dead uncle. Yeah, you know the rest. There were some things he'd rather not go into. What matters is that when, it happened, he was thrown headfirst into the life of a teenage vigilante in the most vigilante-hating country known to man. Lucky him, huh? He didn't care, either way, it was his choice to put on the mask and go out swinging through town. Things the past five months of doing this have been, eventful, to say the least. He stopped drug deals, Yakuza meetings, shootings and robberies, and everything that the more prominent heroes left to the underground heroes, met some quirkless guy in a mask and a dude in an All Might hoodie who became his vigilante friends and was on his way to graduate from Aldera Middle School. In all honesty, Peter couldn't wait to leave that place, any school that let that blonde second-year bully that quirkless kid didn't deserve to still have kids attending it. His gloved hand went through his messy brown hair, his hazel eyes looking down at what he currently wore. Gray pants along with knee pads, a black undershirt that reached to just past his elbows, elbow pads, red fingerless gloves, red sneakers that had the soles replaced with those from ballerina slippers, a red and blue short-sleeved pullover hoodie with a black spider drawn on the front and a white one on the back, and an old one-strap backpack over his shoulder. Over his face was a red face mask that covered his nose and mouth, and over his eyes were his self-made goggles with expressive bug-like lenses. On his wrists were devices made out of scrap and different parts, his good old web shooters. Imagine what he could do with an actual budget instead of dumpster diving behind support companies. His spider sense rang softly as his ears picked up the sound of a soft landing, it was either someone trained to not make much noise or someone really tiny. He was leaning towards the first option. Hey, kid. A tired voice spoke, Peter turned around and narrowed his lenses toward the man on the other side of the rooftop. The man was the definition of disheveled, an entirely black suit along with a grey scarf-like object around his neck. His hair was black and hung over his bloodshot eyes, his face was unshaven along with a look of pure exhaustion. Crawler told him about this guy one time, and Peter had a few run-ins with him a few months back. Standing on the roof with him was the Erasure hero, Eraser Head. Or as Peter liked to call him, Scarf Man. Hey, Scarf Man. I was hoping the next time we saw each other, I'd be in UA but whatever. Peter greeted back patting the spot next to him on the roof edge. The hero pondered it for a few seconds before sitting a couple feet away from the boy. They sat in silence for a couple of seconds, simply watching the streets below from their spot 12 floors up. How have you been, man? Peter asked, eyeing the man from behind his lenses. Fine. He responded, his tired eyes studied the masked teen. Good patrol? I stopped a couple purse snatchers and an armed robbery earlier, decided to sit here and take a small break. The boy continued to make light conversation, mostly getting no result. Crawler did say this guy wasn't too into talking. I came here to ask you to stop, kid. I let you operate this long hoping you'd quit sooner or later, but I guess that was completely irrational. Nao Mesa is willing to cut you a deal if you come quietly. Aizawa got straight to the point, Peter's body tensed in preparation as to run away if he needed to. Look, it's not like I don't trust you or anything, if anything you're probably one of my favorite heroes, but I can't stop. People out there need help, and sometimes heroes aren't there, so I will be, you don't even seem to be in high school yet. 
you'll get caught sooner or later, and whoever finds you next won't go as easy as me. The man responded dryly, his hand slowly approaching his capture weapon. Why do you even do this, kid? You know it's illegal Peter could only sigh and hop into a crouch, Aizawa tightened the grip on the capture weapon at the sudden movement. He would very much rather scarf man let him go quietly instead of playing cat and mouse all night, Peter had school tomorrow. I can help out, so I do help out, law's got nothing to do with it. Now, can I just go on my merry way and leave you to your brooding on rooftops? I got a math quiz tomorrow, and my aunt comes back from the night shift in like. Peter pulled out a phone with an incredibly cracked screen, it was still visible enough for him. Three hours, can you just let me swing by? Peter added the last part with a small smile behind his mask and a semi-pleading tone. While Peter wasn't a pushover in a fight, a part of him doubted his chances against a seasoned hero. A small bit of panic began to set in as he realized that this may or may not be his last night as a vigilante, he couldn't let this end yet. Not while there were still people in the city he could help. Silently, the man stood up and adopted a small fighting stance, Peter's shoulders dropped at the implications of that. You know I can't do that, just come quietly, so I don't get dry eyes. Sorry but we can't afford to have a child running around unchecked anymore, you need to understand this stuff is serious. He stated with a commanding voice, gone was the semi-gentle tone from before that Peter guessed he used to convince him. Peter stood up and quickly checked his web shooters were loaded and narrowed his lenses at the black-haired man, a scoff escaping his lips. You think I don't know this stuff is serious? I've got scars because of what I do, you guys probably want me off the table cause I'm doing a better job than you. He couldn't help the remark at the end. Aizawa simply stared the teen down and sighed, his eyes glowed a crimson red as his hair and scarf began to float in the air. In a swift motion, he shot out a strand of his scarf at Peter before the masked teen jumped to the side and landed back on the roof. He smirked under the mask when he saw the man's eyes widen at his ability to still use his quirk. Maybe it didn't count as a quirk now that he thought about it. Now, Peter wasn't dumb in any way, shape, or form. He knew that in a one-on-one -on -one with Eraser, he'd probably lose more times than not. The guy had experience and a good weapon on his side, so his best shot was just to run away. And that's exactly what he did. Without a second thought, the boy began to sprint across the rooftop before jumping to the adjacent rooftop to continue his escape. His spider sense buzzed just in time to let him dodge another strand of cloth directed at his head. Come on. I bet you never did this to Crawler. Peter yelled as he looked back, the man had pulled his goggles up while he wasn't looking and began to give chase. He was pretty sure the spider made him faster than normal, but Aizawa still stayed on his heels. Man, he wasn't getting out of this one easily, was he? Whatever, that just made the night more interesting. Peter leaped across another rooftop, nearly making it to the next one before his spider sense rang loudly. Aizawa had sent another strand of the scarf at him, but this time, when he was in the air and couldn't dodge. The scarf wrapped around his left foot before Peter could shoot a web to pull himself out of the way and yanked him back. The brunette flew backward and was thrown onto a fire escape with a loud clang. He groaned at the impact, but quickly rolled out of the way of Aizawa dropping onto his previous spot. The boy shot a web at the man's eyes as he pulled his foot free of its binding, getting up and running just as Aizawa sidestepped the projectile. Hopping from the fire escape and onto the rooftop he was trying to go on previously, the boy shot a web at a building across the street and began to swing away. Now, Eraser could easily jump from the building and tackle him in midair, but who was crazy enough to do that? A couple of people, but he hoped Eraser wasn't one. Stop resisting and come in quietly. The voice of Aizawa yelled, Peter turned his head mid-swing and frowned at seeing him still giving chase and keeping up with his swinging. Why couldn't he just look up the other way? Dude, just let me go, and we can all just forget about this. Peter yelled back over the shouts of the crowd below at seeing what they thought was a villain chase. He couldn't run away, Eraser wouldn't let him. That only left one choice, didn't it? Peter twisted his body at the apex of his swing and shot sideways toward the rooftops. He sent a dive kick toward the underground hero that missed its target and landed him on the rooftop. I don't want to fight you, the man said, his scarf starting to float in the air just as Peter got up into a crouch. He narrowed his lenses at the man and scoffed. Clearly. It's not like you've been doing that for the past five minutes. Not wasting any time in further banter, Aizawa shot forward and launched several strands of his capture weapon. Peter weaved through the attack, quickly jumping high into the air and doing an axe kick which the hero dodged. His spider sense blared as Peter was met with a gut punch just before he landed. He rolled to a stop and shot two webs at the man's feet, and tripped him. Come on, stay down. Instead of responding, Aizawa reached into a hidden pouch and threw a series of small black pellets that exploded into a thick cloud of smoke. 
The boy took a deep breath and closed his eyes, letting his spider sense guide him to dodge the strand shot at him with ease before he ran out and toward the hero. He threw a punch, with Aizawa narrowly sidestepping and kneeing the teen directly in the face. Peter saw stars as his world spun, he barely dodged another punch to the gut before he backflipped across the room to get some distance. Scarf Man wasn't holding back, was he? And man, did that hurt? He just hoped his nose wasn't broken. Shaking out of his dizziness, Peter ran forward while shooting spurts of webbing to try and slow Aizawa down. Can't we hug this out? The quip wasn't met with a response as Aizawa flipped through the air and landed with a kick to Peter's rib, knocking the wind out of his lungs. Peter slid across the roof as he took in greedy breaths into his lungs, Aizawa simply walked forward and stood over him. The teen simply stared up at him, the man's bloodshot eyes seemed to have the smallest bit of pity in them. Just as he began to breathe normally again, he took out the man's feet from under him and brought him to the ground. Peter quickly shot a web at his right arm and pinned it to the ground. I'll be going now. He smirked under his mask at the man as he began to stand back up, the hero simply cursing under his breath and glaring at him. He jumped off the rooftop and shot a web, wincing at the pain in his, everywhere, and started to swing away. He just wanted to lay in bed now, maybe he could convince May he was sick so he could just rest for the day. His lenses widened at the deafening blaring of his spider sense, he looked back to the roof to see Aizawa leaning up and throwing an object. Peter swung forward to avoid whatever it was before the sound of his web line being cut reached his ears. As if it happened in slow motion, Peter looked up to see a black knife cut directly through his lines as it flew through the air. He tried to shoot another web only for his web shooters to give a small spurt noise. Jammed. Oh, this was gonna hurt. Peter fell through the air and into the streets below, landing face up on the hood of a parked car. Gasps rang out around him as a crowd began to circle around him he looked around as his ears rang, his body ignoring him screaming at it to get up and run away. He saw how they murmured about his being some villain and recorded him, he even heard one guy talking about his car being ruined. God, this sucked. The boy began to wobbly get up only to fall back down with a grunt of pain, he gritted his teeth and tried again before feeling something wrapping itself around him. Oh no. Eraser head gracefully landed in front of him, a firm hold on his capture weapon as he lifted up his goggles. It didn't have to be this way, kid, the man dryly said, although Peter noticed an emotion he didn't recognize in his voice. Peter didn't even bother to struggle against his bonds, he knew only people with all might level strength could break out of the capture cloth currently around him. Please, he said quietly, giving one last attempt at talking his way out of his current situation. The man only gave a grim shake of his head as his hands reached out toward his mask. You know? If anyone was gonna take him in, Scarf Man was the one he would be least mad at. The hand pulled up his goggles up to his forehead, revealing his hazel eyes that were filled with a defeated look. He just wished he could've done more before the end of the line, at least he did good. His mask was pulled down, revealing his bruised face to the world. Spider-Man no more. Gasps rang out through the crowd as Aizawa's eyes widened, Peter only stared back at the man. He's just a kid. No respect for the law. He's so young. Serves him right for being a good-for-nothing criminal. Aizawa seemed to ponder something inside his mind, the grip on the scarf tightened for a second before he breathed out a sigh. You're under arrest for vigilantism and illegal cork use. Let's go, kid. And with that, he began to drag Peter away while pulling out his phone as the crowd watched. They sat there for a minute or two before a cop car came in, Aizawa putting Peter in the back and him sitting in the front before the car drove away. It had to end sometime, right? At least he was pretty spectacular with he lasted. Alright. Let it be known that he had expected many things when he eventually got arrested. A couple of those expectations were met, mind you. Neo Mesa was in the corner of the interrogation room giving him a friendly look, Scarf Man was standing next to him to make sure he didn't do anything, and he was wrapped up in his scarf and tied to a chair in an interrogation room. But that was a given, it was expected for this stuff to happen. What wasn't expected was the weird-looking, white-furred animal with a scar that was wearing sneakers along with a suit and tie that was currently sitting in a booster seat across from him. The creature stared at him with a calm and happy expression before it gave a silent nod and hopped up onto the table, walking up to his face. Why, hello. I've been waiting to meet you, Mr. Parker. You are quite the hard young man to contact. Why, I had to get Shoyuta to go get you. The animal gave a high-pitched laugh and clapped its paws together. All right. This was a joke, right? There was no way that Scarf Man had to beat him up and all just to get him to a meeting with a Build-A-Bear. Peter looked to his side and shot a question glance at Aizawa, surprisingly the man gave him a sympathetic look back. You must be quite confused, correct? Pardon me for getting ahead of myself there, it's just so exciting to meet such young talent. You must have questions, so ask away. 
The room fell silent for a second as Peter looked between the creature and the two men in the room, pure and utter confusion in his voice. Who I mean, what are you? After a second of silence, the small animal laughed once again and threw its arms in the air. The sound sent a chill down Peter's spine. Who knows? I may be a bear, a dog, or even a mouse. What really is important, is that I am Nizu, Yue's very own principal, and Shoyuta, otherwise known as Eraser Head, is one of my staff members. Questions. Just so many questions. Scarf Man was a teacher? That felt irresponsible. A one-foot-tall teddy bear ran Yue? He didn't really have a problem with that at first, but this thing just scared the hell out of him for some reason. Peter once again looked at Aizawa, prompting the man to sigh and run a free hand through his hair. Yes, the rat is the principal and my boss. He's also one of the most intelligent creatures on the planet, so let it be known that he doesn't come to personally talk to any random teen without reason. Shoyuta is correct. You see, you are quite an interesting individual, Mr. Parker. Wait, something just dawned on him. How did Nizu even know his name? How do I dash know your name? I know many things, young man. Things such as how you are Peter Benjamin Parker, son to Mary and Richard Parker but taken in by your uncle and aunt. Things such as how you three moved to Japan from New York after your uncle got a job offer and how you developed your quirk after a trip to a science expo and then used your newfound abilities to win underground fighting rings both in Muzutafu and New York, along with doing occasional vigilantism on the side. Alright, now he knew why that thing scared him. He was about to speak, but Nizu wasn't done. I also know how your uncle was tragically murdered by a man robbing a convenience store, a man you later arrested and turned into the police, an act that kickstarted your dive into full-time vigilantism for the past five months. The boy stared at the chimera wide-eyed, prompting the creature to give a satisfied grin. I'm just, gonna ignore the fact that you know so much about me is super creepy and really scares me. Peter started, earning a hearty laugh from Nizu. Why do you even want to talk to me? Shouldn't I be in a jail cell somewhere? Also, was this whole thing legal? It sure didn't feel like it. I want to get to know you, of course. As I said, you are quite an interesting individual. Nizu responded, the animal gave a quick look at Naomesa, making the man nod back and place a couple of items on the table. First were his web shooters, second was his goggles, and third was his backpack. First things first, explain your quirk to me. Peter flinched at the sudden change in Nizu's voice, it sounded calmer and way less, unhinged than before. I can uh, do whatever a spider can, stick to walls and stuff, you know how they lift 60 times their body weight? Nizu nodded, smiling wide. Yeah, I guess that makes me super strong, I'm a bit faster and more durable than normal, and I got, kinda like a sixth sense? It dash alerts you of danger, correct? I've seen recordings of you in action, it seems nothing less than low-level precognition. What do you call it, again? Spider sense? Oh, I'll always love how humans name things. Peter paused for a second, then ultimately decided to ignore the creeping dread this thing was putting on him. From a look around the room, Scarf Man and Naomesa were in the same boat as him. How did anyone allow him to run a high school? Now, explain these devices on the table to me. Don't worry about the backpack, for I have already looked through it. Well, those are my goggles. Peter gestured to the goggles inside a plastic bag that laid on the table. I used sensors and camera lenses to help them squint and widen so I don't get overwhelmed by visual input, my quirk kinda dialed up my senses a bit, so it gets annoying. Nizu grinned wider, he paced back and forth on the table with his paws behind his back. Quite an interesting invention. Not only does it serve a practical purpose, but from what I heard, it has made you appear more approachable and friendly to people you have come by. Approachability is quite the good trait for a hero to have. Now, then. Explain these to me, they fascinate me the most. The boy took a deep breath, then complied with the request. They're my web shooters, I can do most things a spider can, but I can't make my own organic webbing. Peter looked around the room only to see Naomesa intently listening while holding a paper pad while Scarf Man listened with a less impressed look. I made a chemical compound that would act like spider webs, along with having the same tensile strength. I made the web shooters to shoot it and then used it to swing around and for capture and combat. Nizu nodded, the smiling animal looked to Naomesa and received a nod from the man. You said you made all of this yourself, correct? No one manufactured it for you or anything. Uh, yeah, I made them myself. Peter felt even more on edge now for some reason, he watched Nizu's emotionless eyes for what felt like ages before the chimera spoke. I say, you are nothing less than a prodigy. Intelligence along with good instincts and a good quirk, very impressive. But, I do have to ask. The room grew still as Nizu walked up to Peter's face, his face showing a grin. Why do you want to be a hero, Mr. Parker? He asked, pause behind his back. What? What was he supposed to say? 
All right, Parker, calm down. Just tell the truth. I've messed up in the past, you know? I lost my uncle because I messed up, and I have to live with that. He told me that with the ability to help someone comes the responsibility to do that, and I only understood that after he died. Peter paused, he saw how Eraser was not gripping the capture weapon as tight or with as much caution anymore. I'm not a hero because I want to, in all honesty. I am so tired and burnt out of this gig you wouldn't believe. But the thing is that people are better off because I went out there every day, that means I have to keep going out there and continue to do what I do. I want to show people they can be better, I want to show them they don't have to make the same mistakes I made to do better. Nizu watched the boy intently, the creature gave a soft hum and allowed him to continue. And I don't even know if I'm doing this right, or if what I'm doing is better than just letting pros do what they do, but I guess I'll never know until I actually do it, right? Being a hero is just a leap of faith, I guess. But seeing old ladies smile when I help them cross the street or how people sigh in relief when I come in and knock out a robber at least gives me the small solace that I'm doing something right even if people call me a criminal or a menace, cause at least I know there's someone out there helping out the little guy. He paused once again, breathing out a sigh as the three people in the room watched on. I want to be a hero because I want to do the good that these abilities let me do, cause I know that I can help someone out there, that means I have to. The room fell silent as the boy finished talking. Peter saw how Eraser had a more thoughtful look in his eyes than before. As the group sat in the deafening silence, the quiet was broken by the small, high-pitched chuckles turned giggles that Nizu gave off. Before anyone could ask, the animal gained a fond smile as he looked from the boy to Naomesa. The man perked up as he saw the creature's gaze. My quirk didn't go off once, he didn't lie. The black-haired man responded, pocketing the paper pad into his coat. Nizu turned back to Aizawa and waved a paw, the man standing there for a second before Peter was suddenly unwrapped as Aizawa pulled his scarf back with a hint of reluctance. The boy's eyes widened at his sudden freedom, he rolled his wrist while missing the sensation of having his web shooter on. He looked at Nizu after a second of getting comfortable with a questioning glance. Just as I expected, young man. Here's what's going to happen, you will be put on parole and be forced to do 400 hundred hours of community service as long as you agree to attend UA, or else you'll be fully convicted of your charges. What do you say, young man? Nizu smiled, extending his small paw toward the boy for what Peter guessed was a handshake. Peter hesitated for a second before he captured the small paw with his own hand. The creature smiled brightly and shook his hand with incredible enthusiasm. Nomesa smiled a small smile and exited the room. Excellent. There are six months until the entrance exam, so you will have time to get settled with your new situation and the conditions of our deal. He walked to the other side of the table and hopped onto Eraser's shoulder, the man reluctantly letting him stay there as the animal hid inside his scarf. Eraser gave a small nod and started to walk to the door before Nizu turned his head to give Peter one last look. I expect great things from you, young man. See you at UA, Spider-Man. Your aunt will come in shortly with that, the two walked out of the room and left Peter in silence. The boy ran a hand through his hair as a small smile graced his face. That teddy bear hadn't only given him one of the best opportunities of his life, but he even remembered the hyphen. Author's Note Hey guys did you like the new story, to be honest I was bored the other day and randomly had the idea of writing Peter being arrested one year before canon and meeting the big three as first years, so we'll just follow Peter becoming a hero in a different environment than usual. I'll have to de-age them by one year but whatever, we'll get there when we get there. Also, there is gonna be some huge butterfly effect shenanigans going on later. Some darker than others, but that's not for a while. The cold and grey interrogation room was still as hazel eyes looked into emerald ones. May Parker stood by the doorway as Peter sat in his metal chair by the interrogation table. Hey, Pete. The woman said softly, quickly moving to stand next to the boy and enveloping him in an embrace. Hi, May. He said back, melting into the hug as he rested his head on the taller woman's shoulder. He didn't know why but any anger he guessed May would have shown just wasn't there, she seemed more like a mother trying to comfort her son. Peter guessed that was for the better, he had a long night. You alright? She asked, running a hand through his hair in a soothing manner. Yeah, just tired. You're not mad. May pulled back and scoffed, an incredulous look behind her glasses. What? No. I know things have been, hard recently, without Ben around. Peter winced at the mention, May squeezed his shoulder reassuringly. And harder on you since you got your quirk a couple months back, but I know that you did what you did because you meant well and wanted to do what you thought was right, Hearing those words brought out emotions Peter didn't know he was feeling, it was a mixture of happiness, relief, sadness, and pure exhaustion. As he sunk into his aunt's shoulders and let his tears fall, she simply hugged him tighter. I can't blame you for being like him, Peter. She said quietly, Peter hugged her tighter. 
I miss him, May. I really miss him. He choked out, continuing his quiet sobs. I know. Hey, let's go home, alright? You need rest? She told him, stroking his back as Peter pulled back and wiped the tears with his sleeves. Yeah, I'd like that. He was just so tired. He just wanted to go to bed. It's been such a long night. The sounds of crushing metal, seagulls, and waves crashing onto the sandy shores filled the morning air, Peter wiped the sweat off his brow as he readjusted the scarf he wore. The boy had come to the beach with black pants, the sneakers that let him use his quirk, black gloves may had made him, the same hoodie he wore as part of his vigilante costume over a long-sleeved black shirt, along with a red scarf. A cool breeze flew through the beach, the boy shivering and rubbing his gloved hands together for warmth. He hated the cold. Picking up a small fridge, Peter used his strength to crush it into a compact cube, throwing it into a pile of random appliances that were also crushed. Who knew community service would be so repetitive? It was October 17th, two whole months since Peter's talk with Nizu, he had found himself with a lot more time in his hands since he had been switched to online school due to his past actions possibly hurting Aldera's reputation. Crazy how they didn't say that when that green-haired kid got bullied every day. For the first few days, Peter had struggled to figure out exactly how he could get those 400 community service hours, so he, you know, didn't go to jail and all. He had tried to sign up at places like random orphanages or homeless shelters, but the only ones near had apparently been shouted out by Best Genist, making them have so many volunteers they couldn't accept any more. Which was so stupid, how could you have too many volunteers? After he had done some digging and walking around, he had finally found a good place a week after his arrest. Dagoba Beach. Muzutafu's very own natural beauty turned dump. Apparently, the sea currents had been leading thrown away trash onto the shore for the past couple of years, and it had gotten so bad by the time when people had started to notice that everyone just gave up on even trying to clean it up. That's where Peter came in. Aizawa had agreed to him getting the hours in by cleaning the beach and giving it back to the community, so that's what Peter has been doing for the last two months. He's been going from left to right, crushing things like fridges, cars, washing machines, and anything in between, then carrying it all the way to the collection zone at the other end of the beach along with things like the trash he had bagged up. By his count, he must be at around 360 hours since he's been doing this for 6 hours a day, every day for 2 months. The sad thing was that he had just finished up one third of the beach. Eh, at least it gave him something to pass the time. Weirdly enough, Peter had kind of begun to enjoy his time cleaning the beach up. It ended up giving him that feeling of being useful and helping out he had lost when his vigilante patrols went out the window. By this time, Peter had kind of depended on that feeling to keep him going, it gave him a reason to keep going forward and keep doing what he did. It was like a small high, you know? Just filled him with pride and accomplishment. Peter ran a hand through his hair as he grabbed as many cubes he made into his arms and began making his way toward the collection zone, thanking his quirk for giving him a better sense of balance, so he didn't drop any of the things he was carrying. As he walked, he let the sounds of the ocean soothe him slightly, being alone on a beach always let his thoughts run rampant, and the noise helped to keep him focused. With a sigh, he let the trash fall out of his arms and into the five-square-foot outline that was the collection zone, he placed them into a semi-neat pile and began his journey back to the rest of the trash. At least it gave him a bit of a workout. The boy walked on the sands, hands in his pockets before he paused, the familiar light buzzing of his spider sense in the back of his skull. It was the type of buzzing that told him someone was near instead of alerting him to actual danger. Excuse me, young man. A voice called, it sounded sure of itself and wise for some reason. It was safe to say what he saw when he turned around didn't seem like it would have that type of voice. A few feet away from him, standing in the sand, was a skeletal-looking man with shaggy blonde hair that had two bangs that hung over his forehead, an angular face, along with sunken blue eyes. He wore an All Might t-shirt with the word Smash, on it in bold letters along with cargo pants and a beige coat, they hung off of his body and were many sizes too big. Even though he looked incredibly creepy, he gave a small and crooked smile that radiated comfort and warmth. Yeah? What's up? Peter greeted back, giving a small smile. I tend to pass by this beach every now and then since I moved to the city a couple of months ago, and I couldn't help but notice someone has been cleaning it lately, was that you? Yeah. I've been doing it for the past two months, I plan on having it all cleaned up in four months or so. Peter responded, the man instantly lit up. Why, that is incredible. Truly a heroic thing to do, giving back to the community. Tell me, what is your name? The man asked, giving a hearty chuckle. Peter Parker. The skinny man smiled and nodded, his sunken eyes seeming to brighten up. Tashinori Yagi, it's a pleasure to meet you, young Parker. The two continued in light conversation, 
Peter actually enjoying Yagi's company more than he thought he would. He just gave off some sort of All Might-like vibe, you know? Just kinda calmed you down even if you already were calm. As they talked, Yagi decided to ask a question that seemed to have been on his mind since the start of their encounter. Young Parker, if I may, why are you cleaning this beach? It seems rather strange for someone as young as you to do something like this? Yagi asked, hands laced together as he sat next to Peter on the sands. Internally, Peter had started to panic. A part of him was reluctant to just give away the fact that he was a vigilante at one point, yet the other had a weird amount of trust in the man he had just met. As if he already knew him. Ultimately, that part of Peter won out. I, uh, got arrested on vigilantism two months ago, community service was part of the deal to keep me out of jail. Yagi wore a shocked expression, he seemed to want to say something, but Peter continued. You know a vigilante called Spider-Man? Dude in a hoodie swinging around? Peter asked, Yagi nodded and listened attentively. Yeah, that's me. But don't get the idea I'm only cleaning this beach cause I'm being forced to or anything. The boy laughed, Yagi adopted a thoughtful expression. Well, what is the real reason you are cleaning it? After I got caught, my life lost that feeling of accomplishment and satisfaction when I helped someone, you know? It kinda kept me doing what I did, so I guess this is a way to get the feeling I'm being helpful back, even if I don't get to see the people I help? The blonde thought about it for a moment before he chuckled and gave a soft smile, his mouth opened to speak but was cut off by his phone buzzing. He pulled out the device and opened it up to see that he had received a message, as he started to get up to leave, Peter couldn't help but notice who had texted him. Nizu. That, didn't make sense. Uh, Yagi? Yes, young Parker? Sorry I looked at your phone and all, but how do you know Nizu? He asked, he watched as Yagi froze on the spot. Well, he has offered me a job at UA, and we've been talking about the details. How do you know him? Peter raised an eyebrow at how he changed the subject quickly. He was the one to offer to get the charges dropped after I was caught, Eraser Head brought me in, and he was there to talk to me. Told me I had to attend UA and do community service, so I didn't get convicted. Yagi's eyes went wide. He did? That's, quite strange of him. Yeah, I guess. What are you gonna teach? Peter asked, also standing up from the sand and wiping it off of his palms. The man froze once again as he began to enter a small panic before composing himself. H heroics. He wants me to teach first years, but it might have to wait until after next school year. Whoa, really? That's super cool. I didn't know you were a hero, what's your hero name? Peter watched as he froze once again, this guy was acting kinda weird, wasn't he? Wait, are you an underground hero like Eraserhead? You don't have to tell me your name if you are, they like secrecy and all. Peter added, Yagi seemed to visibly calm down. Why yes. I am an underground hero. I am sorry, young Parker, but I must be going now. I look forward to seeing you clean this beach. With that, the man gave a small smile and a wave before walking away. Peter simply watched him leave as he tried to answer his own questions in his mind. That was weird. Also, why did he seem, familiar? Maybe he saw him on TV or something. Peter sat on top of one of the last pieces of trash left on the second third of the beach, a five-foot-tall refrigerator. That, another fridge, and five or six cars in different conditions were all that was left. He scrolled through his phone, smiling inwardly at the photos he had taken swinging around, back when he actually could swing around. Patrolling had reinforced his love of photography, he guessed it was because he could get shots he never could before. I mean, have you ever taken a selfie at the top of the Empire State Building? That picture was the one thing that helped him stop fearing heights, it was nice how now he could finally hang it up in his room without hiding from May. As he looked through the pictures, he couldn't help but notice the snow that hit his nose, reminding him of the date. December 9th, four months into cleaning the beach and two months before the UA exam. Peter had already checked in with Aizawa once he hit 400 hours, but he knew he just couldn't let the beach half clean. Pocketing his phone, he hopped down from his perch, gripped underneath the appliance firmly, and lifted it with little to no effort while hissing at the coldness of the metal. The cars would probably make him break more of a sweat, but he should be fine as long as he didn't go over 7 to 8 tons. He needed to work on getting his max strength up, it just felt odd not having it be at 10, you know? Peter walked through the sand, letting his spider sense guide him to avoid broken bottles or random microwaves that would trip him up. As he dropped the fridge at the collection zone, he rubbed his hands together to try and get some warmth to his finger, touching the cool metal of the fridge had done nothing to help warm him up. Once he had come back to where he came from, he started to pick up the other fridge before his spider sense buzzed lightly, making the boy look up to see a sight he didn't expect. Hey, hey, whatcha doing? Is your quirk super strength? You've been lifting fridges like it was nothing. Wobbly hovering a foot or two off the ground next to the fridge was a girl, 
Her big curious cerulean eyes looked him up and down as her periwinkle hair that reached to her hips waved in the wind, golden and sparkling spirals come out of her feet, she wore a scarf, a dark blue hoodie, and black joggers. What? Before he could respond, the girl hovered herself over the fridge and sat down at the top with a satisfied huff, kicking her legs in the air. Did he know her? Ah. Uh, he started, quickly being cut off by the girl smacking her forehead and hopping down to the sand. She stood at what must be 5 feet 3 inches to his 5 feet 6 inches. Oh. I didn't even introduce myself, did I? Sorry about that. She gave a small laugh before extending a hand. Hi. I'm Nijire Hado, pleasure to meet you. Peter quickly glanced around him before he shook her hand, it was incredibly warm even in December. I'm Peter Parker. The girl instantly lit up now that they introduced themselves, she took off the ground with some difficulty and sat back on top of the fridge. Great. Now we know each other. Hey, hey, Parker Cohen, do you mind if I ask about your quirk? I can't tell what it is by looking at you, and quirks are really interesting to me. Oh, and you can keep moving fridges and stuff? Alright, this was kinda weird, but, he thinks he can deal with this? Maybe? She said he could continue cleaning, and it's been a while since someone has come by the beach. He guessed he could use some conversation every now and then. Alright, do you want to get off the fridge or anything? He asked, the girl thinking about it before shaking her head, she seemed to be bouncing up and down. Cool, what did you ask, again? Gripping the bottom of the fridge with both hands, he hissed at the cold and lifted the appliance up into his arms, quickly switching his grip, so his hands were digging into the sides. For some reason, the girl, did she say her name was Hado? Yeah, Hado began giggling a bit when he lifted the fridge. Whoa, you're super strong. Anyway, I asked about what your quirk was. Is it super strength or, is it more? Telekinesis? I heard some telekinesis can make you super strong. Tell me, tell me. As he began his journey to the other side of the bridge, he couldn't help the small smile across his face while he heard the girl ask a question then try to answer it herself before repeating the process. She sure was weird, wasn't she? It's called spider, lets me do whatever a spider can. The girl widened her eyes and began to ask more questions before Peter continued. Spiders can lift 60 times their weight, so I'm strong. I'm also a bit faster than normal for some reason and can stick to walls with my hands and feet. He said, dropping the fridge at the collection zone and watching the girl hop back down. It also gives a sixth sense that alerts me to stuff around me, cool, right? Peter smiled as he began to make his way back to the cars, Hado floating behind him. That's so freaking cool. Hey, do you have fangs? You don't look very spidery, so that's weird. Wait. Can you make webs? What about venom? Hado began rambling as she did loops around him, letting small golden sparkles fall to the ground. The two went back to the cars, Hado floating over to what looked to be the front half of an SUV and sitting on the rusted hood. Eh, he stopped heavier. This one wasn't even moving. I can't make my own webs, but I made a chemical that acts like spider webs, check it out. With a flick of his wrist, a white line of silk shot out and stuck to the front bumper of what was left of the car, Peter gripped the strand firmly and began tugging it across the beach over his shoulder. The sound of the groaning metal moving through the sand and the waves of the ocean filled the cold December air, a girl's excited giggles could be heard over the noise. Oh wow, that's so cool. You must be like, crazy smart. Hado called, Peter giving a slight laugh as he kept pulling the car along. Man, he missed the feeling of his web shooters being on his wrists, he had started to wear them all the time due to force of habit and simply because they made everything easier. He could just web a soda can over to him from across the room. They were so cool. Besides, it wasn't his quirk, so it wasn't illegal to use them, you know? Too bad Aizawa had banned him from making any new models. Peter pulled the sleeve of his black undershirt back to check the time on his watch, he sighed when seeing it was 2.31 p.m. already. He missed his break by half an hour again. Who knew moving trash made you lose track of time? Not him, that's for sure as he walked, he shot a web to his backpack that laid on the hood of a car and pulled it into his hands, he opened and let the smell of the burgers that may had made him before he left his house, good thing his payback was great at keeping the heat in so they hadn't gotten cold. Oh, that smells good. You taking a break? Hado asked as she floated around him, he gave a nod as he sat down on the hood of the nearest car and watched her do the same. Want one? My aunt makes pretty good burgers. He offered, taking out a wrapped burger and offering it to her. Does it have pickles? She tilted her head, Peter scoffed. We aren't insane, Hado. The boy handed her the burger after she made a gimme motion as he took out his own, the two simply eating together, listening to the waves hit the shore, and watching the occasional bits of snow fall down. The boy handed her the burger after she made a gimme motion as he took out his own, the two simply eating together, listening to the waves hit the shore, 
and watching the occasional bits of snow fall down. Hey, Hado. He called Midbite, Hado turning her head to him. The girl simply gave a hum, tilting her head, so her long hair fell to the side. What were you doing here? I haven't seen anyone actually come by here in a bit. He asked, the blue-haired girl perking up. Oh. Well, my quirk takes stamina to use, so I run a daily 10k to train for UA. I started a bit later than usual and then saw you lifting fridges and stuff, you know? So I got curious. You're going to UA? Peter asked, taking another bite of the burger. It was amazing how good of a cook May was. Yep. It's always been my dream to be a hero, so I gotta get better at my quirk to do that. How about you? Are you going to UA, Parker Kuhn? A small chuckle escaped him for some reason. Yeah, I have to so I don't go to jail and all. Hado raised an eyebrow in confusion, Peter could see the gears turning in her head, so he decided to explain himself before she got the wrong idea. I did vigilante work for five months until two months ago, a guy working at UA brought me in, and the principal told me I had to go there, so I didn't get convicted. Cleaning this beach is also part of the deal, but I'm just doing it willingly at this point. He took a bite of the burger, savoring the taste of bacon in his mouth. The blue-eyed girl widened her eyes, getting excited and shooting off into the air by accident. She did a quick loop before she came back down, bouncing up and down where she sat. Oh my gosh. That's so cool. I can't bell wait, you said your quirk was called Spider, right? He nodded, Hado seeming to realize something on the spot. Oh. I knew I saw that jacket somewhere, you were that spider guy that eraser head caught a couple months back. She knew Scarf Man? He hadn't met many people who did. Also, he couldn't help but be relieved that she hadn't called him a criminal and left or something, that would have killed his mood. You know Eraser? The girl nodded up and down so fast her head nearly blurred. Yeah. I love heroes with super cool quirks, so I try to know as many as I can. What was he like? Peter thought for a moment, thinking back to all the times he had run into Scarf Man. He smiled softly before he responded. Grumpy, but pretty cool. He's one of my favorite heroes, they sat in silence and ate for a couple of seconds, you could basically see the amount of curiosity coming off of the girl. Peter sighed and pulled out his phone. Wanna hear some stories about the stuff I did? Awesome. Peter showed her the different pictures he had taken while on patrol or swinging around, some ranging to him taking a selfie mid-fight when he could afford it, and others were just him doing different things such as swinging between cars or running away from a hero chasing him. The girl looked at a single photo and began to spout question after question about it, trying to figure out what he was doing or where he was. Oddly enough, Peter enjoyed her company quite a bit, she just had an aura that warmed up a room or something. As they sat there talking about quirks, she pulled out her phone to check the time, whoa! It's 5.52 already. Oh geez, Parker Cohen, I gotta go. The girl shot up from the hood of the car, Peter doing the same as he figured he might as well get home, so May didn't worry. As he stretched where he stood, a slip of paper was pushed into his chest. Hado was holding the piece of paper and smiling brightly at him, as he looked down at it, he saw that there were a series of numbers on it. Where did she get a pencil? Wait, where did she even get the paper? Here. That's my phone number, call me so we can hang out sometime. You're a super interesting friend, and I want to keep talking to you. Bye, Parker Cohen. The girl told him, quickly waving and jogging off of the beach, onto the sidewalk, and out of view. They were friends now? He guessed he was fine with that. Wait a minute. Did a girl just give him her number? Peter Parker walked the streets of Musudafu, his hazel eyes looking at his phone as his spider sense guided him through the early morning crowds. February 26, the day of the UA entrance exam. He had already texted May that he was on his way to the train station to meet up with Hado, and she wished him good luck in that motherly way she did things. He wore that same red scarf he wore when meeting Yagi, along with the backpack he had when patrolling and the Aldera Middle School uniform. Oh, he couldn't wait to take that thing off. Aizawa had already confirmed that the community service was done, even though Peter would still need a few more weeks to finish cleaning the beach. All that was left was to take the exam. His hand unconsciously reached up to touch the bags under his eyes, he frowned at seeing them in the reflection of his phone. May had tried to help him break out of the bad sleeping habits he got from going out at night, but nothing had worked yet, he was thankful he actually got a full night's sleep before today. That familiar buzzing appeared at the back of his skull, Peter moving out of the way of someone about to bump into him. Weirdly enough, that person had also moved at the same time and crashed into the brunette, all the same, the shorter boy falling on the ground. Oh, you alright, man? Peter outstretched a hand to the green-haired kid on the ground, his wild green hair seemed familiar for some reason. Had they met before? The green-haired boy looked up with a frightened expression, quickly stuttering before muttering out an apology and running away while gripping what looked to be a notebook. 
Ha! Huh, weird guy. Peter began to walk again, seeing how the crowds began to divert towards what looked to be All Might punching a villain with some sort of panda mutation, wasn't he supposed to be in Tokyo? When did he start hanging in Mizutafu? He saw how that green-haired kid ran towards the fight and vanished into the crowd. The feeling that he's seen him before was still fresh on his mind. Now that he thought about it, weren't they wearing the same uniform? He couldn't help but feel some sort of sadness when looking at him, you know? Shaking his head, Peter continued walking, soon reaching the train station that would take him to the next big step in his life. The next big step for Peter Parker. The next big step for the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man oh, hey, 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 Parker Cohen. Finally, you're late. That bubbly and excited voice reached his ears, soon enough Nijire Hato had appeared out of nowhere and was now standing in front of him. Her hair seemed a bit longer than she remembered, she was also wearing a typical middle school uniform. But from a different school from Aldera. It took him what must have been 40 seconds to realize that Hato had been talking that entire time and that he had tuned her out, he really needed to stop doing that. Also, when did they get on the train? He realized he was sitting down in a seat as Hato kept talking while sitting in front of him, had she been talking that entire time? And then this guy with like 9 eyes s you tuned me again, didn't you? He stopped mid-sentence just as he started to listen and gave him a flat look. Uh, no. He gave a weak chuckle as she rolled her eyes. It's fine, Park and Kuen. Hey, you excited about the exam? I bet there'll be so many cool and interesting quirks in there. I just hope we make it in. Hato was back to bouncing in her seat, rattling off all the interesting things that could happen. Peter himself felt both nervous and confident, was that weird? He believed he could pass the exam easily but part of him still feared failure, even more so than normal due to the consequences of him not getting into UA. Snapping him out of his thoughts, Hato had suddenly smiled brightly at him and held out her fist. We'll probably be fine, anyways. We both gotta get in, you know? UA buddies. She said, Peter found himself smiling at the girl as he returned the fist bump. Yeah, UA buddies. Just like that, Peter stared out the window as his worries slowly melted away. The feeling of the form-fitting metal on his wrist brought Peter a sense of calm, a sense of purpose. The boy rolled his wrist while playing with a web cartridge in between his fingers. He'd been wearing his web shooters 24-7 for the past few months, so it wasn't like the feeling of having them on was unfamiliar or anything. But it was just different. Before, when he wore them at home or the beach, it was just the feeling of having them on, but right now. Having them on brought him comfort, it reminded him that they were on because he was gonna do something he hadn't done in a bit. Be Spider-Man. Then again, it was just robots made by a school instead of guys robbing ATMs, but the feeling was the same. It made him feel like he was someone with a purpose. It made him feel like he was Spider-Man again. He guessed he never stopped being Spider-Man, but you get what he's saying. After months of downtime, he was back in the swing of things. Heh. Swing? Get it? He's so funny. The feeling of someone nudging him with their elbow brought him out of his thoughts, Peter quickly remembering where he was. The UA entrance exam. His gaze turned to Hato, who was sitting next to him and motioning with her head to pay attention to what was going on in the front of the room. Yeah, he should probably do that. Present Mike was loudly explaining the basics of the practical portion of the exam, Peter having picked up the parts about being put in a fake city and fighting robots, then being graded on how many robots you destroyed. You know, the important stuff. As he looked around the room, he saw how many people started to nervously sweat at hearing the exam would be combat related. They must have quirks that don't work well on robots. UA did have the horrible habit of screwing over non-combat quirks every year. The room was bathed in bright light, Peter watched as the large screen above the leather-wearing hero started displaying different diagrams and animations explaining the finer details like rules and stuff. This was so boring. Even the written portion was more engaging than this. The only thing that made him pay attention was when present Mike tried to hype up the audience and failed miserably. Peter made the web cartridge dance in his hand, flipping the small object in between his fingers and back while drumming his other hand on the table. Incredibly enough, Hato seemed to be listening with 110% focus, although she seemed to be bouncing up and down at seeing a pro hero. 10 minutes and Peter repeats, 10 minutes passed before the dude finished talking and explaining the exam. Maybe yelling would be a better word? God, was this guy loud. Alright. Now that we're done let's get started with the practical section of the UA entrance exam. Can I please get a plus ultra? Silence. Complete and utter silence, the only sound being Peter snorting before being elbowed by Hato. That's cool, too. Please exit to the left, get changed, and go to your assigned bus. I wish you luck, young heroes. The man announced, the room uttering a quick thanks before everyone excited toward the buses. Finally. 
Present Mike stepped away from the desk and downed a water bottle in one go before starting to make his way toward the observation room. God knows they'll need it. That kid show you'd have brought in most of all, there's no chance can gets him in 1B. Peter rolled his shoulder as he stepped foot on the bus, he sat down and sighed at finally wearing something he was more comfortable using. His old vigilante outfit, goggles and all. It was a miracle Neo Mesa let him keep all of it instead of confiscating it as evidence. Although it did help that the detective was just way too nice, Peter almost felt bad that him running around gave the guy so much more extra work. He ran a gloved hand through his hair and took out his phone from his hoodie pocket. He went to open one of the playlists that he made while patrolling, only to see that they hadn't been played in more than six months. Wow, has it been that long? He guesses he must have lost track of time. As he hit play and pocketed his cracked phone, the bus slowly started to move forward, the kids inside began cheering. He placed an earbud in his right ear and checked that his goggles were still around his neck. The boy proceeded to lift up his hoodie a tiny bit and sighed at seeing that his belt was still there. Nothing was missing, that was good. All there was now was to wait. Should he have a strategy when going into this? Like, avoid certain streets or do some specific stuff. That did sound smart to do, but it didn't feel like him. It didn't feel like Spider-Man Spider-Man felt like a thrill, like doing what you had to do and enjoying yourself. He was about going in without a moment of hesitation. Spider-Man was about following your gut. Spider-Man was about being spectacular. Yeah. Yeah, that felt like him. Peter felt his spider sense buzz lightly as someone sat on the seat next to him just as the bus began picking up pace. It was some shy-looking guy with long indigo hair and elf-like ears, he wore a white short-sleeved hoodie and purple sweatpants. He looked to be in deep thought about something. Should he say something? Eh, sure. Conversation is always nice. Hey, man. I'm Peter Parker, nice to meet you. Peter extended a hand while offering a friendly smile, the boy jumped as if startled. The indigo-haired boy looked between his hand and his face quickly, a look of panic on his face. Reluctantly and nervously, he shook his hand before quickly letting go. All right, then? Titamaki Amajiki. The teen, now known as Amajiki, quietly introduced himself while looking away. He turned back to see Peter still looking at him and got even more nervous, and hid his face behind his hood. This guy was shy. Oh, sorry if I made you uncomfortable or anything. Peter quickly apologized, trying to ease into starting a conversation with the guy. This was a huge contrast to talking to Hado. No, it's f fine. I am not good with me meeting new p-people, sorry about that. It's cool, I get it. Peter waved a hand, inwardly sighing at Amajiki seeming to relax. You nervous? About the exam, I mean. Amajiki seemed to think about his response for a second before sighing and giving a small nod. Why yeah? I wish Mirio were here. The teen responded, muttering the last part under his breath. Peter raised an eyebrow at the response, he guessed Amajiki mainly was talking to himself at that last bit. Should he try to ask about it? It may just be a close friend or something. One of those extrovert and introvert types of things he had heard about, you know? All he knew was that this guy needed some serious hyping up before the test, and Peter was gonna try to give it to him. You'll be fine, man. What's your quirk, anyway? Giving a small smile, leaning forwards in his seat and propping his elbows on his knees. Amajiki seemed to slightly relax at his friendly demeanor, at least he was less on edge now. The bus kept moving as the teens inside rocked it back and forth in excitement. Peter looked out of the window to see the approaching city. Almost time. I it's called Manifesta. Amajiki started, Peter just listened. It lets me get the properties of wh what I eat. That? That was so freaking cool. Dude, that's amazing. Man, I can't even begin to think of how much stuff you could do. I wish I had such a versatile quirk like that, mine lets me do whatever a spider can, but it's not that bad. He laughed, rolling his shoulders as Amajiki nodded. Sadly, that was the end of their talk. Amajiki seemed to be trying to calm himself down with an anxious look on his face, Peter decided not to disturb him. His hand reached into his belt and pulled out a web cartridge, he spun the small object between his fingers to try and relax as his 20th to 21st century playlist cycled to a new song. Fluidly, the cartridge danced in his hands as Peter made it spin around the gaps of his fingers. The boy sighed and put the cartridge back into his belt just as an intercom on the bus announced they had reached their destination, the kids inside the vehicle started to rock it back and forth in excitement. Almost time. Bouncing from foot to foot, Peter checked each web shooter to make sure they were loaded with fresh cartridges, taking them out and putting them back in so they didn't jam on him. His belt held enough to last him about a couple of days or so, so he didn't have to worry about running out mid-test. Almost time. That familiar buzzing in the back of his head came again but it wasn't like his spider sense. All right. Are y'all ready? 
Everyone around him tensed some flared up their quirks or got into traditional running stances. Peter pulled up his goggles over his eyes, letting them widen and squint to adjust to being used suddenly. Quickly, he pulled up the red face mask over his nose and mouth, getting that familiar feeling of breathing through the cloth. His lenses narrowed as his eyes landed on the edge of a building, his hand already hovering over the trigger as he took aim. Get ready. A breath escaped his lips as that buzzing continued, it was different from his spider sense. It wasn't warning him of danger, it felt like pure adrenaline. His feet became less planted on the ground in preparation for what was about to come. Almost time? Go! Whip! Showtime! Suddenly, he was off the ground and swinging several feet in the air. He could imagine people and cars passing below as he flew by. Woohoo Peter hooped, reaching the apex of his swing and doing a flip before shooting another web. That feeling wind of his face? That feeling of gravity leaving him? That feeling of being Spider-Man again? Oh, he didn't realize how much he missed it. God, it was magic. Peter swung around a street corner, spotting a group of robots standing around in an intersection filled with nothing but a few cars and pulling himself down with a web. The crunching of metal rang through the air as Peter landed on a three-pointer, crushing it under his weight. Shooting a web at a two-pointer, he grinned and swung it around him like a flail, taking out what must have been at least seven two-pointers. His spider sense rang, Peter flipped backward and landed on a lamppost, narrowly avoiding the swipe of a three-pointer's tail. Hey, T-800. You missed. Peter yelled to no one in particular, shooting webs at the building behind the green robot and slingshotting himself through it. Peter stumbled the landing, rolling on the concrete as the sparks of the robots flew around him. Shaking his head, he jumped back up to his feet and stumbled before catching himself. He may be a bit rusty on the whole landing thing, but can you blame him? To be fair, he wasn't good at it to begin with. His lenses scanned over the street, all the robots that were once looming over him now laid in pieces scattered around. Counting the numbers painted on the prices of scrap around the street, Peter guessed he might have about 21 to 23 points so far, not bad but not good. Oh, I've missed this. Peter said fondly to himself, already feeling the rush and adrenaline flow through his veins. The only thing that would make this test better would be that the robots reacted to his jokes. It would have been nice if they at least groaned in annoyance at his Terminator 2 reference. Or was it Terminator 1? Man, it's really unprofessional to forget your own references like that. The hairs on the back of his neck stood on end as the sound of dozens of footsteps reached his ears, he jumped up to a lamppost to avoid the stampede of exam takers that flooded the street. As he crouched up there, he couldn't help but be amazed at how cool and useful some of the quirks these guys had were, there was a guy who looked to have some sort of speed quirk. He never even sees those. Although, it kinda bummed him out how most of them weren't even creative with using them, you know? Part of being a hero is using your power to its full extent, and yet some of these people were just doing the most basic things with them. Peter's quirk was straightforward, but he still found ways to be creative with it. He guessed he just wanted to see some cool powers today. His eyes looked around the area, the lenses on his goggles widened at seeing robots lurking around inside the buildings of the testing site. No one seemed to have noticed them, Peter watched as countless people just ran past the buildings filled with free points to try and fight over robots on the street. This, felt weird. From what he heard back in America and while he's been in Japan, UA was a place where only the best of the best could even apply. Was this it? Just people running around shooting off quirks with no creativity? The brunette couldn't help but feel a weird amount of, disappointment? Yeah, that was the word for it. With a sigh, Peter flicked his wrist and launched into the air and through the glass window of an office building, kicking the head off of a two-pointer before he landed. For one pointer's dove for him while making low and metallic hums, Peter jumped up and stuck to the ceiling, watching as the robots crashed into each other. You guys really gotta work on your teamwork. With a small chuckle, he springboarded back onto the floor and crushed one of the one, pointers, he shot two webs at the heads of two others and smashed their heads together. That familiar buzzing in the back of his skull blared in his ears, giving him just enough time to duck beneath a claw swipe from a two-pointer that crashed through the weak wall. He spun around with a kick, his lenses widening when his leg was caught by a three-pointer that had also crashed through the wall. Oh geez. Spinning itself a full 360 degrees, the robot swung Peter through the air and threw him through a wall and into the dim hallway. Ow! Couldn't you have thrown me through the holes you guys already made? I'm not invincible. Peter yelled, groaning as he stood up and frowning at the robots not reacting to his comment. How did he go around getting through walls all the time for five months? This sucked. He wasn't even getting that satisfaction of annoying anyone. That would have evened it out. Shooting two webs, Peter pulled himself through the air and the chest of the three-pointer. At least they were weak, but they still hurt. This was probably Eraser's idea, wasn't it? 
Backflipping, Peter dodged a swipe from the two-pointer and a tackle from the one-pointer he hadn't destroyed yet. As the two robots fell to the floor after missing their attacks, Peter quickly rushed forward and stomped through the one-pointer's chest. Not wasting any time, he ripped one of the one-pointer's arms off and threw it at the two-pointer. Surprisingly, the robot dodged, only getting its right arm ripped off by the projectile and dove at Peter, the boy simply rolling out of the way and catching his breath for a second. God, his back hurt. A lot of him hurt, now that he thought about it. Did he still have those painkillers Knuckle Duster gave him? He kinda forgot being Spider-Man hurt so much. At least the adrenaline was helping him out. You know, for now at least. As the two got up from the ground, they stared each other down. Well, Peter stared the robot down while it just stood there waiting for him to move. It was a lot less dramatic now that he thought about it, but whatever. Alright, good old Mexican standoff. You and me, Robocop. Peter yelled at the two-pointer, the metallic creature simply standing in front of the broken window that brought light into the room as it severed arm sparks. Peter sighed at the silence. Yeah, fighting robbers is way more engaging than robots. Peter shot his hand forward as his fingers inched towards the trigger before the ringing at the back of his skull stopped him. It was blaming in his ears, the boy nearly falling to his knees as the world began to be drowned out. The robot simply looked at him as Peter tried to listen to his surroundings. Hey, there's robots up there. A deep voice rang out, the world seemed to stand still as Peter heard that voice seemed to strain against something made of metal that creaked and groaned before he let out a huff. His spider sense screamed at him to run, to dodge, to do something against a threat that Peter knew nothing about. A threat that presented itself soon enough. With a thunderous crash that made Peter wince, an SUV crashed through the window the two-pointer was standing by, destroying it and taking out most of the wall along with it. Usually, Peter would probably say it was cool that there was someone with a strength cord good enough to throw around SUVs like it was nothing, Peter himself strained when trying to do that, or complain about that guy stealing his kill. And he was about to. That was until he realized something. Most of the car was outside the building, with only the two front wheels actually making it inside. Peter stared in horror at the vehicle, dreading what was about to come. He prayed to whatever god there was for that car to stay there, for gravity to just not exist for that moment. That was until he realized something. Most of the car was outside the building, with only the two front wheels actually making it inside. Peter stared in horror at the vehicle, dreading what was about to come. He prayed to whatever god there was for that car to stay there, for gravity to just not exist for that moment. Whoever he prayed to must have not listened. With the deafening groan of the metal, Peter watched as the car started to slip backward and listened as the people below screamed in terror. Desperately, he started shooting webs that tethered the SUV to the floors, ceiling, and walls of the room, hoping, praying it would just stop. Too bad he wasn't so lucky. The webs around him snapped at the strain of gravity and the weight, he frantically began to shoot more and more as they continued to snap. As he pressed the trigger to shoot more, he heard that clicking sound he always dreads. He looked down at his web shooters, his lenses widening as he pressed the trigger a few more times only to hear that same sound empty. Flicking his wrist, the now empty cartridges were shot out as Peter dug into his belt and loaded in new ones, the lines that held the car continued to snap while Peter reloaded. They weren't stopping it, if anything, they were just slowing it down. Webs weren't enough, he worked on that formula for weeks, and yet they weren't enough. Peter took a deep breath as he aimed his wrists at the car, a new plan in mind. What he was gonna do next was gonna suck. As the webs continued snapping, he shot two lines that stuck to the front of the car and gripped them tightly. Just as he found his grip and stuck his feet to the floor, the last of the webs snapped under the strain. Peter screamed. Immediately, he yelled in pain as the full weight of both gravity and the car was placed on his body, he couldn't even let go to shoot more webs, or he'd risk letting the car fall. Gritting his teeth, Peter pulled the car back as much as he could to little effect, his feet began sliding as the vehicle pulled him down. He stopped cars before, but this SUV was one of the biggest cars he's ever seen. It looked like a model specially made for people with some sort of mutation quirk that made them giants, it must be like 12 tons, and his max was at most 10 tons. Even then, the cars he stopped were normally going at decently low speed and still made him break a sweat. But he's never had to stop one from falling out of a sixth-story floor. Well, he might as well try it out now. Groaning, Peter gripped his lines tighter as the car slowly but surely went off the edge. His muscles and bones screamed in pain, he felt as if he was on fire. Gasps and screams sounded off from the street, which meant that people still haven't run away yet. Why couldn't they just leave so he could finally let this thing go? God, he was so tired. Come on, Parker. Come on, Parker. He screamed in English through gritted teeth as his hands burned. He was hurt and annoyed at the people just watching him instead of doing anything. He was just so tired right now. 
Suddenly, the vehicle finally slid past the edge and outside the building, yanking Peter and bits of the floor he was standing on with it. That wasn't good. Not at all. Peter let go of one hand and shot a web at the side of the building, stopping the car midfall and letting it hang from his one arm. Again, Peter screamed in pain. He felt like he was being ripped apart. As the masked boy looked down to the streets below, he could see the random exam takers just standing there and watching as if nothing was happening. His heart dropped when his lenses landed on some who were recording. This was UA? Painfully, Peter swung on the line he had shot and landed on the side of the building. With a grunt, he let go of the web just as his feet stuck to the concrete and grabbed the sole line that held the car up. Everything hurt, blood pumped in his ears as his spider sense blared to try and get him to let go. Come on, Spider-Man. Come on, Spider-Man. He screamed in English louder this time, his vision began to swim. Why couldn't someone just help him out? Just this once? He was so damn tired. Move! A familiar voice yelled. Peter opened his eyes as much as his body allowed and watched as none other than that Amajiki guy he met on the bus rushed forward while his hands were replaced with tentacles. Amajiki wrapped up the people standing below the car with his tentacles and pulled them a few dozen feet away to a safe distance, quickly doing the same to the few that still remained. The area now clear of people, Peter watched as Amajiki gave him a confident nod and a small smile, a smile that Peter returned under his mask before finally letting go. A cloud of dust was kicked up as the vehicle crashed into the street below, the thunderous impact echoing across the fake city. Peter saw the car now flattened on the sidewalk, he couldn't help but simply sigh in relief at his arms finally being free of the weight. Even if he couldn't feel them, it was an improvement. Just as Peter closed his eyes for a second, the focus on sticking to the wall was broken, and he started to fall to the streets below. Before he could even shoot a web to catch himself or even brace for the impact, he felt something wrap around his waist and slow his descent before it gently placed him on the ground. Amajiki really was the MVP of the day, wasn't he? Peter lay on the ground next to the car, simply staring at the sky with a sense of satisfaction mixed with pain and exhaustion. At least no one got hurt, right? Well, except him. Suddenly, Amajiki appeared before him and knelt down, his tentacles transforming back into regular hands. You uh, are you a alright? He nervously asked, visibly trying to figure out what to do. Never better. Peter weakly responded, quickly wincing at the pain all over his body. Can you, like, bring me over to the starting area? I need to take a quick nap, and I don't want to be in the middle of all of this. He would have waved his hand around to emphasize what he said, but he legitimately couldn't feel anything from the shoulder down. Eh, he'd walk it off. After a nap. The taller teen gave a silent nod just as his right hand transformed into a tentacle that wrapped around Peter's waist and gently lifted him up into the air, Peter already starting to lose consciousness as Amajiki began to make his way to the entrance. Thanks, buddy. As his vision darkened and they reached the starting area, they heard the voice of present Mike announcing that the zero pointer had been released. Peter never got to see it before his exhaustion finally overwhelmed him. What a day, right? His footsteps echoed through the empty floor of his apartment complex as Peter walked towards his door. After losing consciousness, he had been put into the UA infirmary. Some old lady named Recovery Girl had woken him up half an hour and smacked him with a cane after healing him to the best of her ability. Thank God he healed slightly faster. It still left him with his right arm on a sling since he had torn a decent amount of muscles in his arms, torso, and legs, along with nearly dislocated one of his arms. Hado had freaked out at his injuries and at how he was able to hold up a car with his bare hands before she started asking question after question of what had happened. Amajiki bashfully accepted Peter thanking him for helping out when no one did before some buff blonde guy in desperate need of a haircut showed up, gushed over how cool Amajiki and Peter were for preventing people from getting hurt, yelled something about power, and walked off with Amajiki in tow. That must have been the Mirio that Amajiki mentioned on the bus. Also, Peter couldn't help but notice the slight blush on the indigo-haired boy's face when Mirio showed up. Once he reached his door, Peter fished his keys out of his pocket and stepped into his dark and silent apartment with a sigh. Looking around, his eyes landed on a note on the kitchen table. With his good hand, Peter picked it up and frowned at what was written. I am so sorry for this, but work transferred me over to the new location in Tokyo a few weeks earlier than expected at higher pay. I am already at the apartment I rented in the city, so you'll be alone in the house for a bit. I promise I will try to visit as much as I can, please tell me how the exam went when you get back. Love you. May. Great. He was actually looking forward to seeing May today, but he guessed he couldn't complain. They needed the money, and May had worked for this promotion for months by now, Peter could handle being alone for a bit. That didn't mean it wasn't gonna suck, though. It was fine, he guessed. Peter wasn't meaning to stick around too long. 
He had someone to visit, anyway. The boy went to his room and grabbed his old red scarf, he wrapped the cloth around his neck before walking out the door. The cemetery was silent aside from the breezes that blew by and the crunching of dead leaves beneath his feet. Peter walked through the seemingly endless rows of gravestones before finally reaching his destination. With a sigh, Peter sat down on the soft ground and placed his backpack next to him. A simple headstone that seemed to be cleaned regularly, a familiar name was written on it with letters that looked as if they were carved yesterday. Yet, you could see bits of dirt if you looked closely. Hey, Ben, he said softly, to no one in particular. At least no one who would listen. Reaching into his backpack, the boy pulled out a spray bottle of water along with a white rag. He sprayed the stone with the water before wiping it down. He continued the action a few more times before he placed the objects back in his bag, content with the newly cleaned stone. You wouldn't believe how my day went. A knock at the door echoed through the silent apartment. Peter's eyes lightly fluttered open as he awoke from his nap. Man, that was the best nap he's taking in a month, and it's ruined. Lucky him. It's been one whole week since the entrance exam, and things have never been quieter. Peter wasn't staying quiet as a good thing. Hato had been too busy with some family stuff to hang out, and May probably wouldn't be able to visit from her apartment in Tokyo for at least another month. So it's just been him. Alone. Doing nothing. Man, he missed May. Aside from continuing to clean the beach, the most exciting thing he had done so far had been finishing the design for the costume he had to submit when the school year started. While there was still a chance he wouldn't get it, it was fun to just sketch up what he could do with a budget, you know? Maybe he could get Aizawa to let him work on his own gear or something, it didn't feel right using something he didn't make himself. Another knock at the door, Peter jumped as he had forgotten there was someone there. As he began to get up from the couch, a white envelope slipped through the door's mail slot and hit the floor with a soft thud. Pulling the envelope into his hands with a web line, he couldn't help but let his hazel eyes widen in surprise when seeing it. On the envelope was stamped a red version of the UA logo. His results. Peter sat straight up on the couch as he used every ounce of that spider gave him, tearing the paper in half and letting a small metallic object fall to the ground with a small thud. It was a shiny silver in color, with a couple of vents around the edges, and big enough to fit in his palm. Was, was that normal? He was pretty sure he never got sent a disc in the mail back in Queens. Maybe it was a Japanese thing? Like bowing and stuff? He still didn't fully understand their culture. Leaning away from the object from his seat on the couch, Peter nudged the disc slightly with his foot, nearly jumping up to the ceiling when it started to hum and whirl while emitting a soft glow. Was this a bomb? Did UA send him a bomb? Before Peter could leap away or web up the glowing device, a burst of light exploded from the disc, illuminated his dark living room, and made him shield his eyes. Hey, kid. Congrats on passing, I guess. The voice of Shoyuta Aizawa reached his ears, Peter stopped covering his arms only to see a hologram screen being projected from the disc. In awe, Peter swiped a hand through the projection and chuckled at how it flickered in and out as his hand passed through. Holograms. So cool. Wait, did they need this thing back? Maybe he could take it apart and use it for parts. Wait. Results. Focus. The hologram showed the image of Aizawa simply standing in front of a yellow wall with the UA logo painted on it. The man pushed his long and messy hair to reveal his tired eyes, his face held the same bored expression as always. You did fine in the written portion, got a 93% or something. I didn't really bother to look since All Might was supposed to be doing these, but that rat made me do yours. The hologram spoke, Aizawa shoved his hands in his pockets as the screen zoomed out. Wait, All Might? Why would he be reading these? Anyway, the written portion doesn't decide whether you get in or not, but you probably already know that. In the practical portion, you managed to get a respectable 31 combat points before you ended up passing out from holding an SUV specially designed to hold 12 people with extreme types of height and weight affecting mutations, some ranging to weighing 2000 kilograms or being 5 meters tall on the lower end of the genetic spectrum. A red number 31 appeared next to Aizawa, the word combat was under it. While that is just about enough to pass, we didn't just count combat points, the man on the screen gained a grin, one that Peter wished he would never see again. Next to his combat points, a new green number 70 appeared with the words rescue underneath it. What? A hero's job is to protect those around them at all costs, it would be the epitome of irrationality were we to ignore that type of stuff. Parker, you stopped a 12,000 kilogram vehicle from falling out of a building with your bare hands, going above and beyond to protect other exam takers from getting injured. That is what we're looking for in UA. Suddenly, the screen changed to a video of Peter doing his best to pull the car back inside the building while people underneath him simply watched as if nothing was happening. 
the video fast forwarded to him holding it while sticking out of the building before Amajiki moved the people out of the way. Quickly, the screen flickered back to Aizawa, who was still wearing that scary grin. 101 points, earning yourself first place in the exam along with a seat in the hero course. You will be in my class Parker, make sure not to disappoint. Peter simply watched the screen as a few tears welled up in his eyes. All the things that brought him to where he is weren't for nothing. Ben didn't die for anything, Peter could make it up to him now. Welcome to UA, the kid. Aizawa stretched out a hand with more enthusiasm than usual, a look of pure amusement and determination in his eyes as his grin transformed into a challenging smirk. To your hero academia? With that, the screen turned black as small bits of confetti rained down on the screen, and the word congrats appeared in bold yellow letters. The silence returned once more, leaving Peter to laugh and sob by himself. He didn't let Ben down, that was all he could ask for. Can't believe they're making me wear a freaking tie. Peter muttered in English as he walked the UA halls, desperately trying to tidy up the red neckwear before finally giving up and letting it stay loose. Seriously, a tie? So stupid, he hated uniforms. A dress shirt? A blazer? God, he looked so dumb before he changed up the outfit. Instead of the regular shoes, he wore his self-made black sneakers with the soles that let him stick to things, his tie was loose around his neck, and his sleeves were rolled up to the elbow, showcasing the scars that were there. He used to mind them a lot, but over time he just stopped being self-conscious about it, you know? No point in hiding them anymore, anyway. A black one-strap backpack had a few pins and patches depicting tourist attractions back in New York and old movies to top it off. Oh, and who could forget his web shooters? He had tweaked the design of the MK.1 model so that the trigger slid back into the part around his wrist and not be stuck on his palm, making them look like regular silver bracelets. Super fashionable, if you asked him. Peter wandered through the crowd of students wearing similar uniforms, finding solace in the fact that they looked just as or even more lost than him. Seriously, the place was a damn maze. The only thing he knew about where he was going was that it was on the first floor, but that didn't stop him from nearly crashing into at least seven different classrooms. Eventually, Peter decided to stop walking and look at one of the maps on the wall that people were crowding around. Part of him forgot that this place was at least five times the size of Aldera. His eyes scanned around the map, he quickly made a mental note about where the support department was until he finally found out how to get where he was going. Class 1A, one of the two hero department classes for first years. Finally. With a sigh, he walked off toward the direction of where the map pointed him to while rolling his wrist, his other hand unconsciously trailed the few scars around his forearm. Maybe he wasn't entirely over them, huh? He walked and walked around the halls, by the time he realized he had wandered onto the second floor, he realized something. Somehow, he got lost again. Two minutes. It took him two minutes to get lost again. Damn it, how is it easier to swing around the city than to find out your way around a high school? Somehow, he got lost again. Two minutes. It took him two minutes to get lost again. Damn it, how is it easier to swing around the city than to find out your way around a high school? As he came back to the first floor, he checked his phone to see there was still two minutes before class started, he just needed to figure out where his class even was in that time. His eyes trailed around the hallways until finally finding someone that could actually point him in the right direction. Standing by the side and overlooking the crowd of students with Kinda Expressio was none other than the R-rated hero, Midnight, who Peter was pretty sure taught at UA. At least, he thinks. Otherwise, he doesn't know why she would be allowed in a school. Walking up to her, she seemed to notice his presence and gained a look that made Peter's spider sense buzz. Oh, why hello there what can I help you with, cutie? That buzzing at the back of his skull got a tiny bit louder as Peter tried to look anywhere but at the women. Just being near her scared the hell out of him. I was, uh, looking for my class? 1A? I've been wandering around for like 10 minutes, and I'm really lost. The boy let out a sheepish laugh, looking up at the woman. Midnight seemed to light up at what he said, gaining a kinder expression and letting out a small chuckle. Oh, you got Shoyuta? That's great. It's right down the hall, kid. Can I ask your name? She asked, pushing back her glasses and putting a hand on her hip. Ah, uh, Peter Parker. Peter watched as the heroine cupped her chin and let out a hum as if in thought. Suddenly, she snapped her fingers and laughed in amusement. Parker? You're that spider kid that was annoying him for five months, right? Peter nodded, raising an eyebrow as the woman began laughing. Oh, that's rich. He didn't stop complaining about you for that entire time. Oh, I gotta tell Hizashi about this. He simply looked at her in confusion, it honestly surprised him that Scarf Man actually talked to people. Thanks for the help, but I gotta get going. Peter gave a small smile, starting to walk down the hall. Oh, you can come to me for help anytime da. 
Peter looked back to see Midnight licking her lips at him, he shivered as his spider sense continued to buzz in warning. That woman was utterly terrifying. Please don't let her be one of his teachers. Before long, the teen stood before the 20-foot door to Class 1A, the place where he would learn to be a hero for the next year. With one minute to spare. Sweet. Taking a deep breath, Peter opened the surprisingly light door and stepped into his classroom. He didn't know what he expected to see, you know? Maybe like a Canadian dude with claws or a psychic guy in a wheelchair, or something. But as he quickly looked around the classroom, he couldn't help but be slightly surprised at how normal everything and everyone was. A completely normal classroom with a podium and board at the front, 20 desks in the middle, and lockers in the back. There were a bunch of kids his age with varying looks, be it a mutation or something else, just talking to each other. Part of him hoped hero school would be a bit wackier but whatever. As he started to sit down toward the back of the room in an empty seat, his spider sense hummed lightly before a small and soft hand placed itself on his shoulder. Parker Cohen. Hi. That excited voice of Nijire Hado reached his ears, as he turned around, he saw she wore the typical girl uniform but with a waistcoat instead of a blazer. Peter gave a soft smile as he looked down at her, normally, he wouldn't have to since she floated up to his height when they talked. Hey, Hado. Glad you made it? At least there was someone he knew in his class. Before he could finally sit down, the girl grabbed onto his arm and pulled him toward the other side of the room. Here, I want you to meet someone I met at the exam. She chirped, pulling him toward the back of the room where he could see Tamaki Amajiki and the blonde guy he left with, Mirio or something? Amajiki? Hey, man. Peter grinned at the boy, Hado finally placing him in a seat next to her and behind the blonde guy who was smiling at them. H hey, Amajiki mumbled, giving a small smile and looking down. Peter looked him over, seeing how the boy wore the regular uniform with no changes, the only thing setting him apart being how it didn't seem he put effort into the outfit. Well, he didn't seem as shy now. That was good. Oh, hey. You're the guy Tamaki told me stop that car. We met after the exam, right? I bet I didn't even introduce myself. I'm Mirio Togata, nice to meet you. The blonde, now known as Togata, extended his hand out to Peter with a blinding smile that radiated enthusiasm and positivity. Togata had seemingly gotten a haircut before the exam, and now, his blonde hair was not styled in a cowlick. He seemed to have a pretty buff build along with blue eyes. Ah, uh, Peter Parker. Nice to meet you, dude. Peter shook the boy's hand, watching as he somehow smiled wider. This dude gave serious All Might vibes. Hey, hey, did you guys see that giant hero that debuted today? Hado asked, taking out her phone and showing it to the three. Peter should have guessed she would have had a case covered in cat stickers. On the screen was what looked like a video someone recorded on their phone of a hero Peter was sure was named something like Kamui Woods that had debuted last month, fighting against some giant villain with a shark head. Suddenly, a giant woman with a skin-tight suit came out of nowhere and kicked the villain off of the bridge he was standing on, the cameraman started to pocket their phone as the news crews arrived on the scene. For a split second, before the video ended, Peter saw a flash of wild, dark green hair in the far end of the crowd. It felt, familiar, as if he should know who it belonged to. Hadn't he seen it last week before the exam? Whoa, she seems so cool. I think her name is MT Lady or something. I wonder how big she can go. Hado wondered aloud and pocketed her phone, snapping Peter out of his thoughts. The bell rang, quickly startling Peter. He looked around the room to see everyone still talking and no signs of Aizawa. Was he late or something? Togata nodded with a smile on his face, turning around in his seat. It's been a while since I've seen a hero with a gigantification quirk. They must be super rare. Yeah, the only time I've seen one was from some guy in England or something. I think his name W-Peter was quickly cut off by the sound of a zipper along with some shuffling at the front of the room, all conversation seemed to stop at the sound. His spider sense buzzed in the back of his skull, it was quiet enough to not be in immediate danger but loud enough to tell him something was gonna happen. What that was, he didn't know. Out of nowhere, the form of Aizawa rose from behind the podium and stared the class down. It took you all 42 seconds to quiet down after the bell, that's both irrational and absolutely unacceptable. The man announced, Peter, along with the rest of the students, shrunk under his gaze. My name is Shoyuta Aizawa, and I will be your homeroom teacher for as long as you are here. Peter didn't like the way he phrased that. A dull thud echoed across the room as the hero threw a box onto the ground, it looked to be filled with some sort of blue uniform. Put those on and meet me out in the field in 10 minutes, and do not make me wait. With that, he pulled out a juice pack from who knows where and walked out of the room, leaving the class in silence. Couldn't they have put him in 1B? Took you long enough? Aizawa flatly stated, hands in his pockets as he stood before the 20 students. 
Peter noticed the man was holding what looked to be a softball in his hand. Everyone was now dressed in what Peter could only guess was the UA gym uniform, blue shirt, and pants with red and white accents that spelled the letters UNA on the front. Must be a marketing thing. Also, why were they even there? Shouldn't they be at orientation right now? Alright, let's get started. Most of you did physical tests in middle school like softball pitch and a 50 meter dash, right? Everyone nodded. We're basically doing that, but you will be allowed to use your quirks in any way to improve your results. Peter raised an eyebrow, he wasn't seeing the point in this. And why did he feel he was gonna get singled out? He was gonna get singled out, wasn't he? Parker, Aizawa's voice cut through the air as his tired eyes fell on him, everyone else doing the same. Damn it. You got first place in the exam with 101 points, he stated more than asked, everyone around Peter murmured. What? I got like 60 combat points. He looks super plain, though, right? He must have some crazy ass quirk or something. Peter suppressed a sigh at the attention, he turned his head to the side only to see Hato giving the type of look that said, why didn't you tell me that? Great. Just great. This just be payback for those five months, right? Yeah, yeah, I did, Peter responded. Aizawa proceeded to toss the softball at him, making him catch it without taking his eyes off of the man. Go up to the circle and throw the ball. You can use your quirk however you want to help your throw. His eyes went to his wrists, landing on his web shooters still in bracelet mode. And don't use your wrist things, only your quirk? Eh, that was fair. Peter gripped the ball and walked up to the circle, readying his throw. Oh, and Parker? Peter looked over to Aizawa, the man was sending a glare his way. Don't hold back, because I will know if you do, a shiver went down his spine at that glare, Peter simply nodding in slight fear. He forgot how scary he was. Taking a deep breath, his mind wandered back to that baseball game that Ben had taken him back to when he was seven and still lived in New York, the boy tried to remember the type of stance the players had before finally settling on something similar. Scarfman said full strength, right? He could do that. With a small boom, Peter threw the ball far into the distance, that unfamiliar feeling of using his full strength lingering around his body. It felt, weird, he hadn't used his full strength so freely since when he first got his powers. The only time he really did it was when lifting or holding something. A handful of people gasped behind him, Peter turning back and giving his teacher a small and proud grin. Was that good? He asked, the hero simply looking down at a phone he had pulled out of somewhere and giving a small smirk. Turning the phone back to the class, Peter watched as some of their jaws dropped. He walked back to the main group and widened his eyes at the number. In bright blue, 713 meters were displayed on the screen. Now, Peter still didn't fully understand how to convert meters to feet yet, but he was pretty sure that was good, right? The fact that Hato and Togata were beaming at him proudly made him feel like he did good. That's what I expect from all of you, understand? Use your quirks to your full abilities and give it your all, I will use this test to gauge your abilities at this point. Aizawa announced, the class erupted. That's easy. I will get first place, no problem. Yeah, I am way better than all these losers, my quirk is the best. This is going to be so freaking fun. I can finally cut loose. Peter watched as about half the class either cheered or bragged about the test, that gave him a bad feeling. Turning back to the front, Peter's blood ran cold at what he saw, turning his head to the side, he could see that Hado, Amajiki, and Togata had the same expression. Aizawa had a look of pure disdain and annoyance, looking over those still cheering and in total disgust. That gave him a really bad feeling. Did you just say, fun? Is this all a game to you? You think being a hero is all about firing off your quirks and messing around, huh? Very well then, those who place at the bottom half of the class will be deemed to have no potential and immediately expelled, am I clear? The wind blew through the field, the class completely silent in pure anguish and surprise. Peter looked at Aizawa, who held an indifferent expression and was fishing out another softball as if nothing happened. Part of him wanted to say something, but he couldn't bring himself to under the aura of intimidation the hero gave off. What the hell? I placed second on the exam. I deserve to be here. Who do you think you are? A tall guy with red skin yelled from the back of the group, another five students following up. Yeah. I placed sixth. You have no right to say that shit? A muscular girl with black hair yelled, her shoulders bursting into blue flames. Piss off, man. You can't do that. A short kid from beside Peter screamed. He seemed to have scales around his eyes. Two identical twins with long orange hair started to curse out Aizawa. Peter began to wince at what was about to come. Who the hell AR- a thin girl with short hair began before being cut off by Aizawa. All six of you are now expelled from the hero course and this school. UA gives me full reign to teach as I please, and I will not waste my time on those with no potential or with no sort of heroic traits. 
Aizawa coldly stated, his eyes glowing red as his scarf and hair began to float. The six students deflated where they stood, no one dared to utter a word. Go pack your things and leave. I will not ask again. Not a second later, Peter watched as the six walked off of the fields with their heads hung low, more than half of them were crying. Now, let's get started. The hero said, bringing the attention back to him as he tossed Togata a softball. The blonde simply stood there in shock at what just happened before gaining a look of pure determination and walking up to the circle. Amajiki and Heido gained a similar level of determination to not get expelled as Togata waited for permission to throw the ball. Peter still looked between the ones walking off the field and Aizawa, a look of pure confusion on his face. What the hell just happened? Parker! Aizawa barked, starting Peter. Focus, you cannot afford to be distracted. He said sternly, his eyes looking right at Peter's. Uh, yes, sir. This was you eh, huh? Pretty intense. Peter shook his head and rolled his wrist, he couldn't afford to get expelled when he just got here. He was gonna show how spectacular he was. The first test was the softball pitch, Peter got to sit back and watch as he had already done it. The boy watched as Togata threw the ball a good 80 meters with nothing but pure physical strength, for people after him also threw the ball without using their quirks but only around 30 to 50 meters. He watched as Amajiki transformed his hand into a tentacle just like he had done in the exam and threw the ball 126 meters. Hato stepped up, and Peter saw how she blasted the ball 242 meters away with a sparkling spiral of golden energy, one way bigger than those she used to hover. After Hato, a huge guy with a bald head and arms that reached down to the ground stepped up, he picked up the ball and threw it 574 with an animalistic grunt. The next couple of people didn't even use quirks and threw normally, getting results that paled in contrast to those before. A small part of Peter felt bad for them, they must not have quirks that could have helped them. The next test was the 50-meter dash, with nearly everyone running it normally without any quirks. Two people were set up to race each other and had their time recorded, with Peter racing against Togata. Part of him wondered what his quirk was since he couldn't exactly tell at first glance, but he guessed he was going to find out. When the starting gun went off, Peter shot forward in a sprint and ended up with a time of 4.82 seconds, with Togata beating him with 1.27 seconds. How you may ask? By literally sinking into the ground at the starting line and popping back up at the end completely naked. He gave Peter a quick congratulations for his time and went to grab his pants that were laying on the ground, simply putting them back on. Amajiki didn't even react, Hato seemed more curious than freaked out, Aizawa simply rolled his eyes, and Peter just decided to look away and roll with it. The rest of the class seemed absolutely horrified before Aizawa called for the next pair to race. Peter saw how Amajiki took off his shoes and transformed his legs into those of a horse and got 4.94 seconds against a girl who seemed to use some sort of ground manipulation quirk. Hato used her quirk and flew across the track in 4.31 seconds against a guy with spikes on his shoulders it was getting worrying how few people are actually using their quirks. Aizawa wouldn't actually expel them all, right? Next up was the grip strength, everyone having to try and apply as much pressure as possible onto a handheld device. One of the most boring tests for Peter, with him easily placing first on it since he crushed it. The only interesting use of a quirk came from Amajiki, who made his hand into a clamshell and clasped it on the device, getting 412 kilograms. Sadly everyone else just didn't use their quirks or use them in obvious ways. After the grip strength came the standing long jump, one of the more straightforward tests with Peter and Hato clearing the sandbox easily, Amajiki transforms his legs into frog legs and clearing it as well along with a girl that looked to have springs on her feet. Then last came repeated side jumps, the seated toe touch, distance run, and sit-ups. Everyone with a good enough physique did decently, with Togata, the big arm guy, and Peter doing the best out of everyone, with Hato and Amajiki coming in fourth and fifth, respectively. After getting the results of the last tests, Aizawa gathered the remaining 14 students back on the field and stood before them. Peter saw the terrified expressions of a good half of his classmates, and he could absolutely understand. Even people who did incredibly well, like Heido, Amajiki, and Togata, looked terrified of what was going to happen. In all honesty, Peter was too. He was absolutely terrified of what Aizawa might say. What if he expelled all of them? Either way, Peter prayed that he made the cut. And here? Aizawa started, tapping the phone he held and making it display a holographic leaderboard. Are your results? As his eyes trailed the leaderboard from the bottom up, he nearly cried in both pride and absolute relief at seeing his name at the top of the list, with Hato, Amajiki, and Togata below him. The brunette was about to congratulate the three on their placement before the sound of sobbing reached his ears. Oh, right. The expulsion thing. 
but there was no way he was serious about that, right? It probably was a logical ruse. Something to get them to do their best. He couldn't posse, Parker, Hado, Amajiki, and Togata, step forward, Aizawa called, the four teens doing what he said with fearful expression as they looked at each other. Peter's hand began to unconsciously trace the scars on his forearm, he did not work so hard and get all these scars to be expelled on the first day. He had to make Ben and May proud. You forget to stay in the hero course, you showed great use of your quirks when you could apply them, so congrats, the teacher said, the four breathing a sigh of relief, Togata hugged Amajiki while Hado happily grinned at Peter, a grin he returned in kind. Wait. Why did he only say you four? The rest of you are expelled, class dismissed. He put away the phone and shoved his hands in his pockets, simply taking out and applying some eye drops while the other students ran off the field sobbing. What? Why you were serious? Amajiki asked, a horrified look on his face that they all shared. Aizawa raised an eyebrow at the boy, pocketing the eye drops and running a hand through his messy hair. Yeah? Did you think I wasn't? They had no potential, so I expelled them. No way. No freaking way. What? I thought that was like, a bluff. To make us do our best? Peter exclaimed, looking at the man with an incredulous look on his face, Togata seemed to hold Amajiki a bit tighter while Hado gaped at the man. What the hell was that? The man simply gave that same grin he had during Peter's acceptance letter. Plus Ultra, he said, making them all look at him in shock as he walked off the field, leaving them to stand there while processing what just happened. So it's just us now? Hado asked, looking at the three teens with her. I guess so. Togata reluctantly let go of Amajiki and put his hands on his hip. The four stood in silence for what felt like hours, Peter eventually breaking the silence. At least we passed. Right. He gave a small chuckle while raising a hand for a high five. The three simply looked at him, Peter slowly putting his hand down. Too soon. His classmates looked at him for one second before nodding. My bad. His day finally over, Peter walked through the halls of UA as he traced the scars on his forearm. What a day, huh? At least he wasn't expelled. He was just glad he made it through. The boy sighed as he walked the halls, pretty sure that he was going in the right direction toward the exit before a familiar head of shaggy blonde hair. He turned just in time to catch the man's sunken blue eyes along with his attention. Mr. Yagi? Young Parker? The two stared at each other for a minute before Peter cleared his throat, breaking the silence. Ah, uh, I thought you started teaching next year? The boy said, making the man perk up. Well, there was a change of plans, I was heading to meet Nizu just now. Hearing what he said, Peter looked at how the man was dressed in a yellow pinstripe suit that hung off of him, he did look dressed for a meeting. Oh. Sorry to stop you like that. I'll be going, don't want to hold you here or anything. Peter quickly apologized, only getting a chuckle and a smile from the skinny man. It is no problem, my boy. I look forward to seeing how you grow into a fine hero this year. With that, the man nodded once before he walked away. Peter watched him go before he pulled out his phone and walked in the opposite direction. The second he unlocked the crack device, a news article was put on his screen. Breaking news. A brand new villain in Musutifo holds a student hostage. We are getting reports that an unknown villain whose body consists purely of a green, slime-like substance has taken hostage an unidentified middle school student in central Musutifu. Heroes are now on the scene, we wait to see how they rescue this poor child caught in the clutches of the villain. This villain has been at large since early today morning and has already claimed one victim's life. The victim has been identified as the 14-year-old Aldera middle student, Izuku Midoriya. At reading that name, Peter's eyes narrowed as he tried and tried to jog his memory about that boy to no avail. Izuku Midoriya, why did that name sound familiar? Authors note, I was originally meaning for Peter to see an article talking about how Izuku committed suicide, why I talked about a trigger warning last arc, but decided to just have the slime villain kill him since All Might was at UA during that. Why was All Might at UA a year early? Well, cause of Peter. I made it so he saw Peter as a potential successor, making him take the UA job earlier than in canon. I did say there was gonna be some dark butterfly effect going on, right? Sorry for killing him off, but he just didn't fit into the story too well, and him being alive would be too much like canon. And quick thing, the fact that Peter is gonna be afraid of being near midnight is gonna be a running joke, cause why not? Morning, Scarf Man. Peter greeted the man as he walked into the classroom, momentarily pausing when seeing how there were now only four desks in front of the podium. Man, you really expelled them? I thought you'd take it back or something. Aizawa was standing at the podium while writing something. Peter went to the back of the room and started to put his backpack in his locker. I only teach those with potential, Parker, the 16 students that were here simply did not have any, Aizawa stated, 
barely looking up from his place at the podium. Does that mean you can see how amazing I am? Sadly, the only response he got was an annoyed grunt. Yeesh, couldn't the guy be more talkative? Suddenly, his spider sense buzzed just in time for him to catch what looked to be a plastic card thrown his way. Peter's eyes went to his hand to see that he had caught what seemed to be a student ID with his info, didn't he already have one of these? Uh, is this a gift card for my birthday? It's not until October 12th, man. The boy commented, turning the card in his hand while looking to see what made it different from his last one. Flipping it back to the front, his eyes landed on some golden words below where it said he was a hero course student. His eyes widened as he read the words, full access to support studio. No way. No freaking way. Why you're serious? I get to use the support studio? But I'm not even in that course. A few excited laughs escaped him, the boy continued to read the words over and over as if they would disappear. Power Loader, the head of the support department, read the designs for your costume that needed to be submitted before the school year started. After getting through the five pages of notes and sketches, he went straight to Nizu and did that. Aizawa nodded his head toward the card. Full access to UA's support workshop? That's absolutely insane. The only place that had better support making would be something like I Island. Finally, he could make the things he always dreamed of making without having to dumpster dive behind support companies or take apart random things he found on the street while walking home. Finally. Finally, he had an actual budget. This is a privilege, Parker. There have only been six hero course students to be given that type of benefit, do not waste it. Oh, I won't. No way I'll go back to getting parts from Dogaba Beach or let someone else make my gear. Peter laughed with glee, he pocketed the new ID and looked down at his web shooters. He may not be able to make the MK.2 models anymore, but he'll make the MK.3 models. And who knows what other stuff he could make. Oh, what about a bat signal? Or a sword? What about metal spider legs from his back or an AI that controlled his suit? All right, maybe not the last two. Those seemed way too overkill. You made your gear from trash? The voice of Aizawa snapped him out of his thoughts. Peter looked up from his wrists to sad the man looking at him with a raised eyebrow. Uh, yeah? Didn't really have money to make them out of anything else, didn't Nizu say I made them myself? The boy stood from his spot kneeling in front of his locker, and went to his seat. He was pretty sure Aizawa was there for that part. Yes, but I thought you had better materials, that's impressive, Parker. The man said, looking back down and continuing to write. Did, did he get a compliment? From Scarf Man? Before Peter could say anything, the large door opened, and in walked his three classmates. It's still weird to think how they were the only ones left. Good morning. Togata called out, Amajiki close beside him and Hado behind. Wow, you really did expel them. That's what I said. He started being all gloomy and talked about potential and stuff, you know? Peter commented. Hey, hey, you look super happy right now. Did something happen? Wait, is it your birthday? Hado sat beside him, leaning toward him and asking him question after question. Yeah, US seemed to be in a good mood. Amajiki mumbled from his spit beside Togata, there was a small hint of curiosity in his voice. Yeah. Scarfman Dash do not call me that during school hours just gave me a new ID that gives me full access to the support studio. I can finally make my own gear. Wait, really? That's amazing. Did you make support items before? The blonde spoke, walking back from putting his backpack away and sitting in his seat, seeing this, Hado and Amajiki went to do the same. Yeah, it's what these are. Peter held up his wrist and knocked on the web shooter with his knuckles. They're made of stuff I found dumpster diving behind support companies, but now, I can make them even better. That support gear? I thought they were regular bracelets cause they looked fashionable. Hearing this, Peter leaned forward in his seat with a smile. I know, right? I think the silver really pops, UK and Dash as Peter began to talk, Aizawa cleared his throat and brought the teen's attention back to him just as the bell rang. Talk about timing, huh? If you four are done, then I suggest we get started with class. Oh, right. UA was also a regular school. Lame. He hoped they would do something cool today. I am here. To teach? A hulking mass of red, white, and blue burst through the door, a small wind being created from the speed of his arrival. Looking up, Peter couldn't help but let his eyes widen at what he was seeing. All Might, the number one hero, standing in his classroom while wearing what looked to be his Silver Age costume. Whoa! It's All Might. I wonder what he's doing here. Hado sat up in her seat, looking at the man with wide eyes. No way. It really is him. Togata yelled, pumping his fist in the air in excitement. Beside him, Amajiki even seemed taken aback by the arrival. Why, I am a teacher here. And I? The hero began before trailing off as his blue eyes scanned over the four students. Uh, Aizawa? 
Where are the other students? Expelled. They didn't show any potential. These four are the ones who did. There was silence for a couple while the hero looked between Aizawa and the teens before he cleared his throat. Okay. Well, I suppose I trust your judgment. Now, I hope you kids are excited for your first session of heroics training. Heroics training? Sweet. In a blur of movement, All Might shot his hand forward and held a card with the words battle written in red letters. Battle training? Even better. Battle training. A hero must know how to fight in order to protect others, so that is what we will be doing today. Oh, and we cannot forget this part. Suddenly, their respective lockers in the back of the room opened up with a hiss of smoke for what must have been dramatic effect. Slowly, a platform holding what looked to be a suitcase slid out of the compartments. When did they get those in there? They opened them this morning. Costumes. All Might's booming voice reached his ears, Peter's eyes widened at the words. Costumes? Like, the ones they designed? No freaking way. Clothes make the hero, as they say. So, how about you all get changed and meet me at ground beta? Do not keep me waiting, young heroes. The man laughed loudly before rocketing out of the room and kicking up a cloud of dust. Clothes make the hero, as they say. So, how about you all get changed and meet me at ground beta? Do not keep me waiting, young heroes. The man laughed loudly before rocketing out of the room and kicking up a cloud of dust. With a small click, his web shooters fell to the ground just as he reached into the silver and shiny suitcase to bring out the MK.2 models the support company had made. Instead of being a silver bracelet that had a carousel system, it was now a dark black that only held four cartridges at a time. As he held the devices in his hands, he turned them and inspected every detail they had, smiling at how the support company had followed his designs to the letter. These new models even came with some new features. Not only were they way more durable and would effectively remove the chance of getting jammed, but he also made it so they made a small clicking sound when out of fluid. Now he wouldn't have to rush into fights blind on how much web he had. Oh, and that was only the web shooters. Let him get to the costume. A form-fitting red and blue suit with a black webbing pattern going over the red parts along with a few additional black lines on the red and a small black spider in the front of his chest, and a red one on his back. He wore red boots with specialized soles and red gloves that got thinner around his fingertips but still gave some padding when he would throw a punch. Covering his face was a red ski mask with that same webbing pattern and his new goggles that kept the old design but added stuff like night and infrared vision. On his waist was a red belt with a couple of pouches in which he carried medical supplies, his phone, and his camera in case he saw something cool on patrol. While designing it, Peter tried to look back on how he could improve his old one. And one look at the scars on his body told him what he needed to fix. He couldn't be a hero while wearing a cloth costume. He had an excuse not to have any sort of protection or armor before, but not anymore. Lightweight and flexible armor was on the front of his forearms, thighs, and shins while keeping the parts of the suit's design they covered going along with being able to be taken off should he need to. To top it off was a bulletproof vest made out of the same material as the rest of the armor and kept the parts of the design it was going over, in theory, it should help him out with things like knives and low calibers. Peter had requested for it to be made out of that newly invented material from Eye Island that was as strong as Kevlar but as flexible as cloth, but that was too expensive. It was fine, he guessed. It didn't affect his movement too much. Wait, speaking of. Where was his vest? Uh, have you guys seen my vest? I swore I left it here. Peter asked the two other people in the changing room with him, Togata and Amajiki. Suddenly, his missing vest was pushed in front of his chest by a soft-looking hand. Wait. If Togata and Amajiki were on the other side of the room. Peter looked to the side slowly to see Hado hovering a few inches on the ground while smiling and holding out his shirt. Hado! What are you doing in our changing rooms? Peter snatched the vest from her, widening his lenses in surprise and putting the vest on. Aizawa sensei said I could be here with you guys since there's no girls left. It got lonely and stuff, so I'm here. Hado laughed, dropping back down to the ground and looking into his suitcase. Ooh, cool jacket, does it have to do with your quirk, da? Yeah, she's been here for like two minutes. You must have been spacing out or something? Togata informed, laughing while putting on his flowing red cape. Amajiki gave a silent nod as he tightened his carrier vest. So much for that sixth sense, huh? Part of him wanted to freak out about a girl just being in their changing rooms. Another part of him wanted to know why Amajiki and Togata didn't even care. But another, bigger part of him just didn't have it in him to care. Peter just rolled his eyes, his lenses mimicking the motion, and grabbed the jacket and the one-strap backpack left in the suitcase. Kinda crazy how spacious that thing was. When designing the jacket, Peter wanted it to be mostly cosmetic but ended up adding small, nigh noticeable pockets on the inside where he could store even more web cartridges and small gadgets. 
Also, it was super comfy. Who knew that heroes made their costumes from such soft materials? He should ask Power Loader if he can make a blanket with this stuff. The jacket was hooded, had long sleeves, and a zipper, it was the same red and blue but had small variations along with white accents and a big white spider on the front and back. Peter had modeled the look over a design for his suit that he scrapped, it felt advanced and sporty if you asked him. Whoa, I can barely recognize you, Parker Cohen. Those lenses make you look kinda scary. Hato chirped while lazily floating around him, he had almost forgotten she was in their locker room his lenses frowned at that. They did? He thought Nizu said they made him look approachable. I think they look cool. His suit has a whole tactical look. Togata said, walking over to the two with Amajiki close behind. He even has a vest like Tamaki. Peter tightened his vest as he grabbed the backpack, it was a simple black with a small red version of the spider on his chest at around the bottom left. He had made it to store bigger types of stuff and additional supplies, also cause he thought backpacks were cool. It's bulletproof, or at least it should be. I don't want to get shot too much, you know? It's still weak in some spots, though. Seems practical. Amajiki muttered, Peter smiled at him from behind his mask. I prefer more simple stuff. The blue Annette laughed, doing a quick loop around the room before coming back to where she was. Peter got a look at her suit, quickly realizing how form-fitting it was and turning away while putting on the backpack. Yeah he uh, wasn't gonna look at that. I wish I could get more protection on my suit. The only reason it doesn't fall off me when I use my quirk is cause it's made out of my hair. Peter narrowed his eyes at what he said, did that mean that Togata's quirk was some sort of phasing thing? If they were fighting each other today, that'd be good to know. Uh, sh shouldn't we go? All Might must be W waiting for us. The indigo-haired teen spoke, pulling his hood over his head. Wait, he was right. They had stuff to do. Author's note. So, it's basically the Stark suit but form-fitting instead of skin-tight, with aspects from the Night Monkey suit like the additional armor, boots, belt, and goggles, but these ones look like the one from the PS4 classic suit and only have one strap going around. Also, the web shooters are the same. Cause I think the Stark suit is the best suit. Oh, and the parts from the Night Monkey suit that covers the Stark suit will continue the Stark suit's design. As for colors, it's the saw as the Civil War prototype suit, so a darker blue along with more noticeable webbing. The symbol on the chest will be the one from the PS4 classic suit, while the one on the back will stay the same as the Stark suit. The jacket will have the exact same design as the advanced suit from the PS4 game, while the backpack will have the front symbol in red on the lower left part. And like I said, the materials used are both lightweight and durable, so they don't cut his movement or anything. Was, was All Might reading a How to Teach for Dummies book? His lenses squinted at the man as the group of teens walked into the observation room, watching how the hero was hunched over reading the book. No way, he was. As Peter looked around, he couldn't help but note how incredibly big the observation room was, it was empty outside from the command panel at the front and dark with only the big screen above the panel giving light. It must have been designed to house a full class of 20, right? As they stopped in front of the man, All Might perked up and pocketed the book behind him before anyone could see it. Anyone except Peter, that is. Oh. Ah, uh, hello, students. You all look amazing, like real heroes. All Might boomed, Peter and Amajiki winced at the volume for different reasons while Togata and Hato bounced up and down in excitement. Now, does anyone have any questions? Hato raised her hand almost immediately, with Peter leaning in beside her. I think he means about the exercise. Her hand went down. While the girl pouted and hit Peter in the shoulder with the force of an angry two-week-old puppy, Amajiki timidly raised his hand. W what exactly will we be be doing? You only said combat training but D didn't specify. Wait, he was right. They didn't even know what they were doing. All Might began to open his mouth to answer before Peter's spider sense buzzed lightly, everyone watching as a floor tile beside their teacher opened up with a hiss. A white-furred animal with a scar going down one of his beady eyes popped out of the hole with a visible grin. Was that? Nizu? Peter didn't know if he should be worried about the principal being here or the fact that there were secret tunnels around the school. Was that even legal? It didn't feel like it. Why, hello. With a bit of effort, the chimera scurried out of the hole and onto the floor, standing in front of the students next to All Might. I could be a dog, a mouse, or even a bear. But another thing I am is Nizu, principal of this fine school. Silence rang out around the room as everyone simply stared at the creature with varying levels of confusion. A silence that was broken by a squeal oh my gosh, he's so cute. His fur looks super soft. Hato giggled at the animal, Peter noticing how All Might adopted a mortified expression. Surprisingly, Nizu only gave a good-hearted laugh at the comment before he started to climb up All Might and sat on his shoulder. Wait, can he just do that? And they let him? 
Man, having an animal be your boss sure would be weird. Why, thank you, Miss Hado. I do enjoy a fair amount of brushing. Now, I bet you five have questions as to my presence, correct? Silence once again as everyone looked at each other. Uh, kinda? No offense sir, but you really scare me. Peter would remember the high-pitched laughter that Nizu gave off in his nightmares. And by the way All Might shuddered, the guy was on the same boat as him. That rat was freaking terrifying. Peter was at least 60% sure that he was some sort of cryptid passing off as a corked animal to hide his supernatural and eldritch origins. Short answer is that I got curious as to what the four students that Aizawa didn't expel are like. I already know you, Mr. Parker, but I do not know your classmates. Sighing, Peter ignored the looks that Togata and Amajiki gave him, he would explain it to them later. Probably. Also, I want to see how All Might will do as a first-time teacher. But judging by the How to Teach for Dummies book he's been reading all day, it is good that I am here. The creature giggled, casually playing with one of All Might's bangs by whipping it back and forth. But ignore my presence, I will be here to help out if I need to. Yeah, Peter didn't know how to feel about the principal sitting in on his first exercise. All Might looked confused for a second before he cleared his throat and put on a forced smile. W well? Alright. Originally, we were going to do five matches of two-on-two -two heroes versus villains fights where the heroes would try to find and capture a bomb the villains were protecting. Teams would be assigned randomly to give students a feel for working with others that they didn't know well but uh. All Might paused as he looked over the four teens, Nizu kept playing with his hard bang but he didn't seem to mind too much. How well do you four know each other, exactly? He asked, prompting a small chuckle from Nizu. The students looked at each other for one second before responding. Eh. We're friends. Kinda? Not that well? We're best friends. Peter raised an eyebrow at Togata's and Hado's responses, he didn't know about all of them being best friends but whatever. Ha, huh, that certainly does mess things up for me. A booming laugh echoed across the room, Peter could see the small panic in the man's blue eyes. He didn't know why but that shade of blue looked familiar to him. Alright, give me one moment. All Might grabbed Nizu in his massive hand and looked around as if not knowing what to do with him. The man quickly shrugged and just gave him to Hado. The girl grabbed a hold of Nizu in both arms and began to gently stroke the fur on his head while the principal playfully kicked his feet in the air. Watch me exit and return, like a hero. In a blur of movement, a red white, and blue streak rocketed past them and out the door all while kicking up a strong wing. Peter looked over at Hado who was still stroking Nizu's fur happily. Suddenly, the animal squirmed out of the girl's grasp and landed on the tiled floor. Walking over to a tile in front of where All Might stood, he tapped his foot in a rhythmic pattern. Quickly, the tile rose up from the ground with a hiss, revealing a steaming teapot, five teacups on a small wooden table, and a wooden cabinet. What? Anyone want tea? Nizu asked, already pouring himself a cup from a brand Peter didn't recognize. He wasn't much of a tea guy. Oh, oh. Do you have jasmine? Hato walked forward to the table and sat down on the floor just as Nizu began pouring it. Me and Tamaki will take green tea if it's alright? The blonde teen sat on the opposite side of Hato with Amajiki in tow. Peter was, confused as to what to do, to say the least. He wasn't too into tea, and he also wasn't sure if just having tea time with the principal as All Might set stuff up was a good idea. But on the other hand, it felt rude to just stand there. So reluctantly, he went and sat down next to Hato as Nizu handed her a cup. Are you drinking any, Parker Kuen? Hato asked from beside him, taking a sip of the drink as Peter took off his mask and goggles and put them on his lap. Your hair is super messy. A hand unconsciously ran itself through his hair at the comment, the boy rolling his shoulder. I'm, not that knowledgeable on tea, you know? Never been my thing a dash before he could even finish that sentence, a cup with the same drink that Hado had was placed in front of him, he looked from the girl to see the principal giving him a small smile. Well, we can't have that. Here, try jasmine tea that Miss Hado has been drinking, it is rather exquisite if you ask me. Yeah, what he said. It's great and helps out with energy and stuff, Eyeing the cup over for a second, Peter grabbed the china and brought it up to his lips. It was one of the sweetest things he had ever tasted, it was smooth and silky as it touched his tongue along with having the smallest taste of honey and a fragrant scent. Man, it was amazing. No wonder Japanese people liked it so much. He should have given it a try a while ago. Whoa. This is great. I think I'll try to buy some later, thanks. Peter gave a small chuckle, sipping the tea again and savoring the taste. Hato said something about energy, right? Yeah, he should be thankful for that little effect. He hasn't gotten more than 5 hours of sleep in the past 3 months, part of him feels like the only thing keeping him from collapsing due to sleep exhaustion has to be his enhanced biology. 
Maybe, it's more of a theory if anything that he hasn't met any other people bitten by genetically altered spiders to compare notes with. This was the last class, right? Maybe he could try and catch some sleep after school was up. No problem. It should help you look less tired and stuff all the time. Hato laughed from beside him, he only raised an eyebrow at her. Ha, huh, did she read his mind or something? She put her cup down and stretched where she sat. Oh, it's just that you always look super tired all the time, you know? With your eye bags and all so it might help out. Wait, he looked tired? As in, other people could tell? That, made him a bit self-conscious. I, guess I am. Peter finished his cup, quickly grabbing the mask and goggles on his lap and putting them on again, covering his features. Hidden by the goggles, his eyes trailed to the side, and saw how Hato had adopted what looked to be a guilty expression, her mouth opened as if to say something but stopping herself. Sighing, Peter unconsciously traced the scars on his forearm under his costume still being able to feel the few that weren't covered up by the armor. Lately, the action of tracing his scars when idle had become a bit of a habit, it helped him calm down every now and then. Either way, he felt guilty for making Hato feel guilty and all, he'd have to say something when he got the chance. His spider sense buzzed, snapping him out of his thoughts just as the door or the observation room slammed open and rattled the china on the table. I am back, with a plan for the class. All Might boomed, moving from one side of the room to the next in less than a second. The teens quickly got up from the floor and stood where they were before as Nizu tapped a tile a certain way and made the table, cabinet, and tea sink into the floor again. Peter wondered how many of those hidden tile things were around the school. I am sorry for taking so long, students. But, here's what's gonna happen. Pressing a button on a remote Peter wasn't sure where the man had been keeping it, a holographic screen appeared before them. It was a cartoon of a 10-story building, with what looked to be a woman on one of the floors next to people dressed in old-time robber outfits, All Might stood smiling at the bottom of the building. We shall do, hostage rescue. You shall be separated into two teams of two, heroes and villains. Heroes will have to either safely rescue the hostage and bring them to a safe zone outside or capture the villains inside the building while the villains have to either capture the heroes or protect the hostage until time runs out. You know what? He could do that. Peter had done some hostage rescues in the past when civilians got caught in the middle of a robbery, and he was well suited for fighting in the enclosed space of a building. As for the teamwork thing, Peter didn't have too much experience with that but all of his classmates seemed to be good to work with. At least he was pretty sure. Let's see, uh. The man's eyes darted from one teen to the next and back as he cupped his chin, all the while Nizu climbed up to his shoulder again. Young Parker will be with young Hato on the hero team, and young Togata will be with Amajiki on the villain team. Hato? He can work with that. The girl walked ever so closer to him at the announcement. Beside him, Amajiki breathed a sigh of relief and started to lean on Togata, earning a laugh from the taller boy. Now, go down to the testing site and get ready. The villains will have 10 minutes to prepare, then you may begin. The four teens nodded, beginning to jog out of the room and into the testing site. Once gone, All Might looked at Nizu with a serious expression. Sir, why are you really here? Shouldn't you already know what they are capable of? Nizu laughed lightly, tapping the man on the shoulder and making him turn to face the screen where the teens were shown. Mr. Parker shows promise, but that does not make me ignore the potential threat he could possess with his respective abilities. I suppose I wanted to see what he could do firsthand and act accordingly, I may not even act at all. Silence fell over the room as the two watched the screen, a smile broke on Nizu's face. If things go according to plan, then I believe we could see the birth of something truly sensational, Tashinori. All Might's sunken eyes narrowed on Peter as he watched the screen, the boy simply hopping up to a lamppost and hanging upside down off of it. I suppose I agree. Author's note. I am planning on developing the Nijire slash Peter relationship in the next chapter, so I hope you guys are excited about that. With this being the first time they do hero stuff together, we'll get more interactions between them. Also, I laid the seeds, is that an expression? I don't know, for All Might offering Peter OFA. Given how we are in pre-canon right now, All Might's limit is at around 6 hours so he's not gonna be in too much of a hurry to give OFA away. And Nizu joining Midnight in the UA teachers that scare him. Cause why not? To elevate the ranking? Truth be told, Peter always did wonder how much that spider bite changed his biology. Cause he was pretty sure anyone else's blood would rush to their heads if they had been hanging upside down for the past 5 minutes like he has. Maybe it was a spider thing, you know? Man, it was kinda concerning how he only understood his quirk in the most basic levels now that he thought about it. He'll watch a documentary on spiders later or something. Uh, Parker Kuhn? Hato's voice broke him out of his thoughts, he turned his head to the side and saw how she was right side up. Wait, that wasn't right. Huh? What are you doing? 
Behind his goggles, Peter raised his eyebrow slightly while he rolled his wrist. You've been hanging upside down and cupping your chin for the past couple of minutes. It got boring not talking so I tried to see how it felt like. Kinda woozy. With a small laugh that didn't feel as happy as she normally is, the girl turned right side up in the air and landed on the ground. Oh, he hadn't been talking, had he? They should probably plan or something. Before Peter could speak, Hato decided to cut him off. Hey, are you mad at me? Peter paused at that. What? She sounded, incredibly guilty. The tone of her voice made Peter feel bad even if he hadn't done anything. Sometimes I, uh, ask or say stuff without actually thinking and make people feel bad, you know? It's a bad habit and all. She sighed, sitting on the curb they were by. Sorry if made you feel bad when I pointed out how you looked tired and all, I didn't mean it. Frowning under the mask, Peter did a flip and landed next to his partner, quickly sitting down on the curb next to her. He had never actually seen her look anything but happy, not that he thought about it. In the few months they've known each other, she's normally being a ball of energy and enthusiasm. It was weird seeing her like that, you know? He'd have to do something about it. It's fine, you didn't mean anything by it. Taking off his mask, Peter gave the frowning girl a small smile. No one had ever pointed it out or anything, I guess I didn't even know I was self-conscious about it. They sat in silence for a bit, Peter checking his phone to see they still had three minutes left of prep time. Trouble sleeping? She asked, making Peter pocket the device and look at her. Say that again? I asked if you had trouble sleeping and stuff, is that why you look so tired? His gloved hand unconsciously touched the bags under his eyes as he looked at the building across the street, he could see the occasional silhouette passing by the different floors. Whoever it was must be moving around fast, he'd have to remember that. Remember how I told you about the stuff I used to do? When we met at the beach. Hado nodded instantly. That uh, kinda messed me up in a couple of ways I'm still trying to figure out how to fix, my sleep schedule is a huge mess, and I'm still trying to de-stress after all of that. That felt like a good enough explanation, no need to get into the few nightmares he's been having lately. Hado made a small hum as she cupped her chin before suddenly snapping her fingers. I know. I'll help you out. Cheerily, she beamed a smile at him while Peter looked at her in confusion. Help me with what? You said you had trouble getting rest cause of how stressed you still are over your vigilante thing, right? And how you're still trying to figure out how to deal with it messing up your sleep schedule. She asked, Peter gave a small nod and let her go on. What was she getting it? Also, how could someone smile so brightly like that? Can people just do that? I'll help you relax the best I can. We could try to go hang out and have fun so you're not like, sulking and brooding all day, you know? It's the least I can do for making you feel bad earlier, anyway. Peter blinked at her for a couple of seconds. He had never really had friends growing up, given how he was quirkless and liked to stick by himself. By the time he did get his quirk, being Spider-Man took up most of his time so he didn't try to socialize even though he easily could. So you can understand why he was so confused right now. Having someone so eager to help you out when you need it and that wanted to hang out with you was, unfamiliar. A smile began to spread itself across his lips, his eyes softening as he looked at the girl. It wasn't that bad though. I'd, like that, actually. The girl smiled wider and pumped her fist in the air, shooting off the ground and doing a quick loop before coming back down. When she landed, she looked at him with an expression filled with positivity and happiness as she grinned in accomplishment. A small feeling of warmth spread across his chest as he looked at her, Peter decided to ignore it and stand up now that they had talked things out. Hey, let's talk about this stuff later, alright? We gotta go beat up Amajiki and Togata in a bit. He put the red mask over his face, quickly putting on the goggles and letting the lenses widen and squint to adjust by his count, they should one to two more minutes before the exercise started. It should be enough. Oh, right. Hey, do you have a plan? I can try to come up with that but I'm better on the fly and stuff. She bounced up to her feet, hopping from foot to foot next to Peter in excitement. Well, they're probably on the higher floors since that's where most hostages are kept, I'd say either the sixth or seventh floor. Peter cupped his chin, quickly hopping up to the lamppost and hanging upside down from it on a web. Weirdly enough, it was easier to think that way sometimes. Amajiki said his quirk lets him manifest properties from the stuff he eats, so far I've only seen him do that with animal parts but it may go beyond that, and it most likely only lasts as long as it is in his system. You know how some transformation and emitter quirks change the body to better use the quirk and stuff. Peter looked at Hado, who had hovered up to his level. My body is a bit more durable than normal since it's adapted to the recoil of my blasts, something like that? The girl titled her head, Peter snapped his fingers and smiled under the mask. Yeah. So, maybe his stomach takes longer to digest or keep stuff in his system for longer so he can manifest food more often, right? That means that waiting his quirk out is out of the picture. 
Peter hummed and narrowed his eyes in thought before looking at Hado again. He only seems to be able to do one manifestation at a time from what I've seen even if he has multiple at his disposal, so the plan would be to try and overwhelm him to the point he can't switch fast enough and take him out, sound good? Amajiki probably had the most versatility out of all of them, but he could only do one thing at a time no matter what. Peter was planning on exploiting that. Sound good. I can probably keep him at a range but he has those tentacles he can make, so maybe you'd be better suited for it. Wait, what do we do with togata -kun? Doesn't he have some sort of warping quirk? He didn't tell me what it was when we met at the exam? The girl asked him. Peter thought about it for a moment, remembering how Togata had sunk into the ground the day before and how he said his costume was made out of his hair so it wouldn't fall off. It has to be some sort of phasing. Remember how he sunk into the ground during the race yesterday and popped up at the end of the track without clothes? The girl hovering quickly thought about it before nodding. I think he phased through matter, and gravity took effect on him and pulled him down since he still had mass. Sounds freaky, Peter deduced, earning a thoughtful look from Hado as she looked at the building. Then how did he pop back out? Well, matter can't overlap, right? Hado nodded at his question. Well, in theory, if he were to materialize while in the ground, he would be repelled and shot outwards. But if he still has a major weakness? Wait, if he phases through his clothes and the ground, then he has to phase through everything. Hado put her fist on her open palm. Man, it was nice to plan with someone who could follow along for once. Crawler was the most teamwork he has done, and the guy couldn't follow along too well. Yeah. That means he goes through stuff like sound, air, and light. It'll be like falling in an endless void. Whoa, that sounds super scary now that I think about it. Yeah, but it's still cool. Wait, how do we counter him? We can't really know where he pops out from. Peter couldn't help the smirk that appeared on his lips. His spider sense really was great. Remember when I told you I had a sixth sense back at the beach? The boy grinned at seeing the girl's eyes widen in realization. Yeah. You could use it to predict when he comes from. Awesome. The girl pumped her fist in the air before doing a barrel roll in excitement and landing back on the ground, with Peter doing the same with an elegant flip. Peter reached into his belt and checked his phone, should be about a minute and a half before it starts. You go for Amajiki and I go for Togata, deal? Best case scenario we capture them both and if things get messy we can just grab the dummy and run. Peter held out his fist toward the shorter girl. Almost immediately, she returned the gesture and smiled widely at him. Deal. Let's do our best. Peter grinned back, ignoring the feeling of warmth that swirled in his chest at seeing her smile. He'd figure that out later. Probably. Let's do spectacular. Peter grinned back, ignoring the feeling of warmth that swirled in his chest at seeing her smile. He'd figure that out later. Probably. Let's do spectacular. The two stood there and watched the building with determination, Hado hopping from foot to foot while her hair swirled at the movement while Peter double-checked his web shooters and rolled his shoulder in preparation. Instead of a siren telling them to begin, the next thing they knew a blur suddenly appeared before them in a cloud of dust. All Might gave them a small smile as he shoved something into their hands. These are communicators and capture tape. Use them accordingly and I apologize for forgetting to give them to you. Good luck. Peter and Hado stared at the earpiece and the roll of tape in their hand before All Might dashed into the building at blinding speeds, loudly telling the other two students the same thing and dashing back toward the control room. They stood in silence simply staring at the objects in their hand before they simply put on the communicators and put away the tape. He's, not that good at teaching, is he? Hado gave a small laugh, Peter only nodded in agreement. Did you see him reading that Teaching for Dummies book in the control room? Wait, seriously? I thought that was a joke that Nizu made. D dash you may all begin. Good luck students. All Might's voice blared in their ears, making the two wince. Without hesitation, the two teens headed toward the side of the building and started to go up to the windows in their own ways, Hado flying up at a pace Peter could keep up with while Peter crawled along the wall. It'd be faster if he was running up the wall instead but he was still working on that. Who knows? Maybe he'd have it down if Scarfman had arrested him a month later. Was he still a bit bitter about that? Maybe. Peter and Hado went up the outside of the building until reaching a window on the sixth floor, boarded up with old wooden planks and rusted nails just like every other window that wasn't in the front. Man, Yue really went all out on making this look like a villain hideout. Uh, Hado? Peter crawled next to the window, turning back to face his partner who was floating beside him with a determined expression. How do we want to go into the building? Stealthy or loud? Once she heard what he said, the girl cupped her chin for a couple of seconds while giving a small hum. Peter couldn't help but think that she looked like a puppy trying to act serious. Loud. If this was a real thing then it'd be good to lure villains away from the hostage, right? 
And we wouldn't be at too much of a disadvantage if we announce our position since you got that sixth sense thingy going on. She responded, backing up away from the window and thrusting her hands forward while smiling. Peter thought about what she said for a second. It was not that bad of a reason, they couldn't possibly kill the hostage given the fact that it was an exercise, and luring Togata and Amajiki to them to take them out would make it go by that much faster. Crawling to the side and away from the window they were by, Peter watched as small spirals of golden energy appeared at Hado's palms before growing in size and shooting forward at the window, pushing the girl back a couple of feet and destroying the window. Man, he wished he had a flashy quirk like that. His partner gave him a grin and a thumbs up, he nodded and started to crawl into the building with her close behind. The room they were in was grey and barren of any sort of decoration, Peter guessed it'd be like that for the rest of the building. Kinda reminded him of the old warehouses he would crash drug deals in. Ah, good times. Except for those three or four times that he got shot. Those weren't good times. At least he wasn't gonna be getting shot in the exercise. Hopefully. Silently, they walked out of the empty room and into the grey hallway, the corridor seeming to stretch endlessly before turning a corner. Hey, did All Might give us a floor plan or a map anything? Peter asked, already crawling down the corridor ceiling while Hato floated slightly behind. I, don't think so. He kinda just showed up two minutes before we started, gave us the tape and the comms, and dashed off. So they were just wandering around a maze of a ten-story building blindly while hoping to find the dummy? Great. Rolling his eyes, Peter simply continued crawling with Hato behind. Guess we just have to wander around? At least I'm pretty sure they're on the 6th or 7th floor. Two minutes passed by, the two had just finished searching the 6th floor and found absolutely nothing but more empty and grey rooms. The only thing good to come out of it was that they had found the stairs halfway through. Peter had to admit. This was kinda boring. As the two went up the stairs that would lead them to the 7th floor, Peter couldn't help but feel slightly underwhelmed at the lack of actual combat going on, you know? From what he knew of Amajiki, the guy probably wouldn't seek out a straight confrontation with them, Togata seemed like he would try to play it smart and sneak up on them. Hey, do you think they'll show up? Hato asked, the girl idly floating by his side as they stepped foot on the seventh floor. To be honest? I don't even know. You was hoping they w dash? As Pete turned to face her, a buzzing in the back of his skull stopped him mid-sentence. Spinning back around, Peter's lenses narrowed at seeing a form phase through one of the walls and charge at them. Flipping off of the ground, Peter stuck to the ceiling and used it as a springboard to charge at Togata, the boy panicking and phasing through the floor while letting Peter crash to the ground. Alright. That was, something. Remember that plan where Peter could counter Togata with his spider sense? Yeah, he didn't account for the fact he physically could not hit him. Guess he's figuring out that small detail on the fly. Whoa! You alright? Hato flew over to him and pulled him up to his feet, Peter shaking his head and rolling the shoulder he landed on. Man, did he need to work on landing overall. Yeah, kinda didn't account for Tintin to go ghost mid-fight when planning, that's my bad, Peter said, completely ignoring the fact that his teammate didn't get his reference and started to look around. Even with a strong quirk like that, Togata didn't seem like the kind of guy to just rush into the enemy alone. That means. Closing his eyes, Peter tapped in his spider sense and tried to map out the area. Down the hall from them and standing behind the corner stood someone, and Peter guessed it wasn't Togata Hado. The masked teen pointed down the corridor, flush out the hallway. Hearing this, Hado thrust one hand forwards and shot a spiral of golden energy that enveloped the hall, creating a small explosion once it hit the end of the hall and filled it with smoke. All there was left to do was wait to see who made the next move suddenly. His spider sense rung just in time for him to pull Hado out of the way of a tentacle that burst through the smoke before it drew itself back into cover. As the smoke cleared, Hado and Peter saw Amajiki standing there with his left hand transformed into a writhing pink tentacle and right hand a huge clamshell. Two manifestations? Man, Peter just keeps miscalculating today, doesn't he? Uh, Hado? Yeah. Neither of them took their eyes off of Amajiki, the boy originally had a strong face but began to look more and more anxious the more they looked at him. Peter dropped into a low crouch, fingers flexing and finding themselves hovering over the triggers of his web shooters. Oddly enough, he was getting a sense of nostalgia. Change of plans. Blast him but keep them small enough to not hit me. Hopping up and running on the wall of the wide corridor, Peter grinned at the panicking expression that Amajiki adopted at the fact that he was now in a two-to-one situation. Peter flipped up to the ceiling and shot two web lines at his opponent, the boy rolling out of the way and beginning to charge at Hado with a look of hesitation. Wait. Was he getting, ignored? Peter flipped up to the ceiling and shot two web lines at his opponent, the boy rolling out of the way and beginning to charge at Hado with a look of hesitation. Wait. Was he getting, ignored? 
Peter dropped the fighting stance and simply stood normally on the roof, watching as Hato kept her distance while shooting energy waves that kept in mind the small space while Amajiki used the clamshell as a shield and the tentacle as a whip, occasionally changing the tentacle into a pincer for quick jabs that were dodged. No way. He was getting ignored. That hurt him more than any gunshot. Talk above looking down on someone, am I right? Peter turned to the side to find Togata's face popping out of the roof he was standing on while wearing a goofy grin. I know, right? Wonder how the fight looks like right side up? The two simply watched the fight for a couple more seconds before Peter decided to break the silence. So, wanna tell me where Rachel is? Or do I have to beat you up to know? Togata looked at him confused for a second, Peter frowned, already knowing why. Who's Rachel? You never watched The Dark Knight? One of the best 2000s movies. Togata shook his head through the floor. Just forget it. What was he expecting when he referenced 100-year-old movies? Sighing, Peter dug his hand through the spot of the ceiling he was standing on and grabbed Togata's cape, roughly pulling the boy through the weak floor and throwing him onto the floor. So he can't phase to avoid things he can't react to, huh? That's useful. Oh, was that too hard? My bad, kinda need a lot of force to pull you through the floor and all. Apologizing, Peter hopped down and stuck to the wall by his hands and feet, lenses squinting at the smiling Togata getting up the ground. Hey, no worries. Kinda rattled my teeth but it was cool. Sorry, but you're gonna have to fight me to get to the hostage. Sinking into the ground, Togata disappeared from Peter's view before being shot out of the roof, barely giving Peter time to react. Over and over again, Peter flipped and bounced through the hall while trying to avoid the increasingly fast Togata. So this is what they meant by the Phantom Menace? Leaning back, Peter shot his hand out just in time to grab Togata's materialized fist, startling the boy enough to make him go fully tangible, punching him in the face before grabbing him and throwing him to the ground. Peter webbed his opponent to the ground, sighing as the sounds of the fight at the other end of the hallway raged on. At least Hato seemed to be having a better time than him. He already figured out how his main weakness was that Togata needed to be tangible to hit him since his quirk worked both ways. Comes in handy, but doesn't make fighting someone you can't normally hit less frustrating. Phantom Menace? Oh, I like the sound of that. Thanks for the name. Peter watched as Togata smiled a smile filled with gratitude and sunk through the floor, leaving his webbing behind. Groaning, Peter flipped through the air and avoiding Togata's fist coming through the ground at him. This was gonna be so annoying. The only way Peter could think to just knock him out was to vibrate his molecules fast enough to counteract Togata's molecules also vibrating. And Peter couldn't do that. Hey, Hado. Peter called from one end of the hall, turning his head to watch Hado's fight with Amajiki while doing his best to multitask dodging Togata. Yeah. Hado turned around only to see Peter get sucker punched in the face from a first on the wall, the boy simply groaning and tackling through the wall, destroying most of it. Try to phase through nothing, Casper. Peter yelled, kicking down another wall, and watched as Togata panicked and phased through the floor. Uh, wanna switch opponents? I'm having a bit of a hard time over here and you can keep your distance better. Thinking about it for a moment, Hato let out one last blast that Amajiki quickly shielded and flew to the other side of the hallway before standing next to Peter. Sure thing. Oh, thank god. Nodding, Peter ran toward the other end of the hallway and jumped in a dropkick, getting blocked by Amajiki's shell but making it crack slightly. Hey, can I guess that your life motto is you are what you eat? Peter grinned as he used the shell as a springboard and flipped to the roof, shooting two webs at Amajiki's feet and pulling him to the ground. With a laugh, Peter pointed down at him, the boy showing a mild look of annoyance and nervousness ha. Huh? Your shoes are unt dash looking closer, Peter frowned at the fact that Amajiki was barefoot. Man, that really ruins my joke. Silently, Amajiki turned his clam into a pincer and cut the webs binding him, transforming the pincer into a repaired clamshell. Before Peter could listen to his spider sense, a tentacle grabbed him by the foot and slammed him onto an adjacent wall before slamming him onto the opposite one, letting him slide to the ground. Ow! The vest was supposed to help with bullets but didn't make it less painful to get slammed into walls? What a ripoff. Why you know, were I a lesser man, I'd be making non-PG jokes. Peter laughed, trying to hide the general pain he was in as he got up the ground, quickly grinning at Amajiki's flustered state. W what? Taking advantage of the momentary distraction, Peter shot two webs at the end of the hall behind Amajiki and let himself be slingshot into the teen, kicking him in the torso and taking the air out of him. As he got up, Peter quickly took a deep breath, turning away from his opponent to see Hado keeping Togata at bay, most surrounding surfaces having been destroyed as to not give him anything to phase and hide into. His spider sense rung just in time for Peter to look down at Amajiki, the brunette quickly getting hit with a blunt object directly in the face, 
the impact cracking his right lens and throwing him to the ground. Shaking off the hit, Peter looked to see Amajiki sitting up on the ground with his left arm still outstretched after the blow. A closer look at the boy's arm revealed that his hand was transformed into a coconut? Is, is that a coconut? A few seconds of silence passed as the two stared at each other on the ground, the only sound being Hado and Togata fighting in the background. Why yes, Peter narrowed his lenses. I hate them coconuts. Shooting a web at his hand, Peter pulled on it so that the coconut would hit Amajiki in the head but the boy transformed it into a tentacle before it made contact. Jumping back, Peter tried to quickly think of a plan to slow down Amajiki's reaction speed so he could just capture him quickly. That's when an idea hit him. Looking past him, Peter widened his lenses as much as he could before covering them with his arm. Whoa, Togata. I thought your costume phased with you, man. Put your pants back on. On cue, Amajiki blushed and immediately turned away to look behind him. Alright, Peter was starting to doubt more and more that those guys' relationship was purely platonic. Peter shot a web at his back, pulling him close and hopping up to the roof, quickly starting to spin him into a makeshift cocoon of silk to the point where the boy looked noticeably dizzy from the sudden motions. Man, Peter loved doing that move. Made him look like a real spider and all. Hanging him to the roof by a strand, Peter hopped down to the floor and grabbed the roll of capture tape from his belt, lazily wrapping it around Amajiki's head. Tamaki Amajiki has been captured. Peter faced Amajiki and gave him a small apologetic smile behind the mask, the boy looking down at the ground and avoiding eye contact. Well, that's that. All he had to do was go help Hado Captain Mirio Togata has been captured. The hero team wins via capture. Please report to the observation room. Suddenly, Hado came flying in while carrying Togata by a strand of the capture tape that was wrapped around his torso. Hey, guys. Good match. Togata laughed, walking over to Amajiki once Hado had placed him on the ground. We did our best, Tamaki. We just have to get better. Amajiki looked up from the ground for a second and muttered a quiet why yeah. Flying over to him, Hado suddenly enveloped Peter in a hug while laughing, the teen suddenly locking up at the sudden contact and getting his face shoved onto her hair. That same warm feeling in his chest from earlier came back when he realized she smelled exactly like apples. Whoa! You're like, all muscle. The girl let go and started to aimlessly float by. Yeah, Peter was just gonna try to ignore how hot his face felt. He was also gonna ignore what was poking him in the chest earlier. Yep, he was gonna ignore all of that. I, work out? Gee good job, by the way. He would've gone for a high five but he guessed a hug was a step above that. Feeling someone tapping him on the shoulder, Peter turned to see one of Amajiki's tentacles somehow managed to slip out of the webbing. The tentacle drew itself back and pointed at the cocoon. See could you please G get me out of this? Peter stared at him for a couple of seconds before finally realized what he said, the boy quickly apologized and started to dig into his backpack for the bottle of web dissolvent. Man, he sure hoped he brought it cause ripping that stuff off of someone was not fun. Author's note. I quickly want to point out that this Peter is severely nerfed. As in, not as fast, strong, or experienced as other versions given how he's 15 and needs to not look overpowered next to other characters and all. Just wanted to say that. Anyway, Mirio slash Tamaki is probably one of those few ships that I feel like completely makes sense in canon, so I decided to include it as a background type thing. It won't really affect the story but it'll be there. The night was a cold one, Peter stood back in his old vigilante costume on a rooftop on one of the quieter parts of the city that Peter tended to patrol due to pros ignoring it since it only had small time crimes. This, didn't feel right. As his eyes focused, a lone figure could be seen standing near the edge of the rooftop across from him. It was a girl, probably about 17 to 18 years old but a few inches shorter than his 5 feet 7 inches. She wore grey sweatpants and a light blue hoodie that was pulled over her messy looking green hair. Her eyes were a vibrant green with heavy eye bags under them, Peter could easily spot the fresh tear tracks on her cheeks. She looked tired, scared, and absolutely miserable. She looked like she needed help. Hey, Peter said as gently as he could, watching as the girl tensed up at the sound. A thing that Peter noticed was that his voice sounded a bit younger than he remembered. His eyes trailed down to her feet, noticing how her shoes were off and placed off to the side. Oh no. Whatever you're gonna do, don't. Peter wasn't an expert on Japanese culture or anything, but he knew what was going on. He just hoped he could do something about it. The girl took a few steps back, edging ever closer towards the edge of the building, Peter going forwards to keep the same distance. Why you're too young T to be a hero? Sniffling, she wiped her reddened eyes with her sleeve. I'm just trying to help out when I can, what's your name? Even though Peter was more used to joking around when on patrol, even he knew there were times to do things seriously. In front of him was someone with a problem he couldn't punch away, 
This was when he needed to keep them relaxed and just talk to them. He needed to make her feel safe. Quietly, the girl responded. Emizuku, all right, he just needed to keep her talking. Reaching up to his face, Peter pulled off both his face mask and goggles and tried to give the girl as soft of a smile as he could. I'm Peter, can you tell me what's going on? Peter watched as the girl took a single step back, the passing cars below filling the quiet night air. You D don't have to be H here, J just leave. Her eyes watered again and let go a few tears before stopping, Peter took a single step forward while keeping his hands low. I just want to help, alright? Can you just talk to me? Peter asked, accidentally letting his voice waver for a split second. A big part of him was panicking, he knew he wasn't doing good at keeping her calm or making her feel safe. He wished there was someone on this rooftop who knew what they were doing instead of him. Silently, Mizuku shook her head and let out a quiet sob before looking at him with eyes filled with exhaustion, desperation, and pain. Please, you don't have to do what you're going to do, I'm here for you. He tried to reassure in as soft of a voice as he could while taking two steps forward. Even then, they were still about 30 feet apart and the girl was one step from jumping. Whether or not he could reach her if she jumped was not something he wanted to find out tonight. She gave a humorless laugh, running a hand through her hair and taking off her hood. Doesn't matter, anyway. Eyes widening, Peter watched in horror as she took the final step off the building with a peaceful look on her face. Wait! Peter screamed, shooting a web and sprinting to catch her before it was too late. As if time slowed down, Mizuku gave him a look that he could only describe as thankful as he screamed after her, hand outstretched. He needed to be faster. Why couldn't he just be faster? Why couldn't he help her? Why was he not good enough to save someone? The sound of her hitting the ground and the screams of the few people walking the streets at this hour reached his ears just as he reached the edge of the building. Before he could look, Peter's eyes welled up with tears as he slid down the ledge, letting out a pain scream as the tears started to fall. He clutched the red face mask and goggles in his hand as his breath hitched, it felt like he couldn't breathe. His lungs burned, the boy screaming into the night sky and letting out sobs. Quietly, Peter muttered out apologies to himself. Why couldn't he be good enough? I'm so sorry I was the one here for this. Screaming, Peter sat up in his bed drenched in sweat with tears pouring down his face. His breaths came panicked and frantic, the boy trying to grasp at his bed and anything else solid that would tell him he was actually awake. After a minute of trying to calm down his breathing, Peter closed his eyes and hung his head low. He hadn't had that dream in a while, had he? It was about two months into his vigilantism, he had stumbled on a girl at the edge of a roof and tried to help her. God, he didn't even get her full name. She was so vulnerable, she jumped in front of him and he didn't even know her whole name. Why wasn't he fast enough? His teary eyes darted around the room to take in his surroundings, eventually falling on his old face mask and goggles laying on the ground, close enough to look like how they did when he had them on. It felt like those white lenses mocked him, they mocked him for what happened that night. Peter let out a silent sob as he clutched his chest at the memory, it had been hunting him for the past year or so. Wiping his eyes with his blanket, Peter looked at his alarm clock and saw that it was 3.18 am. Yeah, he wasn't going back to sleep. Peter wished May was here to comfort him but stepping out of his room and listening to the silent apartment told him that his aunt was still in Tokyo. Grabbing his phone from the foot of his bed, Peter pulled up May's number and hovered his thumb over the call button before turning the device off and throwing it on the bed. He couldn't bother her with this. She probably had better stuff to do anyway. Walking over to the bathroom, Peter splashed cold water in his face and took off his sweat-drenched shirt before taking a look in the mirror. His eyes were puffy and red just like how Mizuka's were, the bags under them somehow darker and heavier than yesterday. Looking over at his chest he could easily see old scars from guns, cuts, and even burns littering his body. Tracing his hand over them, he winced at touching a few of the still sensitive ones with the older ones feeling just like regular skin. Every now and then, the older ones that had smoothed out and become faded like the burn on his abdomen or the bullet wound in his upper left thigh would send a sharp pain throughout his body. They were something he had to live with, it didn't mean he liked them. Eyes watering, Peter focused on them. All those fights and all those scars and he couldn't even save a girl in front of him? May always told him that there was something to do at times like this. Pray. And so he did. Hanging his head low over the sink, Peter closed his eyes and spoke. Hey, God, it's Peter Parker. I know we haven't talked in a while and all but I really need to talk right now. Silence, Peter guessed that's to be expected. I just. I tried to save her, you know? I did all I thought I could and I adjust. He gripped the sink tightly, clenching his eyes shut. Why you know that little game we play sometimes? Where I do something dumb or mess up, and other people suffer cause of it. Cause I failed to do something or did something wrong. How you did with Ben. His throat felt dry, a few scars in his chest and back began to sting as he sniffed. 
Why did you have to do it with her? W.Y. couldn't you have placed someone better that night instead of me? Peter paused. Why didn't you give her someone better like All Might when she needed it? Why did you end up giving her a guy who just jumps around and tells jokes? Why did you give her Spider-Man? The humming of the bathroom light was his only response. Like a dam breaking, Peter descended into choking sobs as the images of that last look she gave him started to play over and over again in his mind. Crumbling onto the floor, Peter took short and rapid breaths as the feeling of being suffocated spread across his body while the tears fell onto the tiled floor. Peter had to be having a panic attack, right? He was obviously hyperventilating. Minutes passed as Peter struggled to breathe on the tiled floor of the bathroom before air was finally allowed back into his lungs. Why did he have to be the one there for her? Why was it he failed even though he tried his best? He just wanted to tell her he was sorry for not getting to her in time. He just wanted to tell her he was sorry for not being enough to help her when she needed it. He just wanted to go to bed. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.